Well, hello and welcome back to Skeptics and Seekers. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Dale, representing the Christian or Seeker side. And for our skeptic, we have... Alan. Pleased to, pleased to be here again, Dale. Excellent. Mono a mono. The next round. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Mono a mono. Shroud, Shroud Wars round two, everyone. So, so uh, we had our first debate round one, and I, I'm thrilled to announce that we had a, a very positive reception. It, um, we've had very high numbers in terms of watching the Shroud debates. Um, and believe it or not, Alan, people have been clicking on our links uh, and to do their own research on both sides. Um, it, it even attracted a couple couple Shroud skeptic bigwigs um, and one pro Shroud bigwig, uh, Bob Rucker, Hugh Ferry, and Colin uh, Barry. So, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled with the response that we've been getting and the feedback we've been hearing on the Shroud. But today is for round two. So last time we covered uh, Alan's evidences for the Shroud being proven to be medieval. This time the shoe, shoe's going to be on the other foot and I'm going to be trying to prove that it's not medieval. Um, so in terms of topics, uh, what we have planned is uh, we're going to be covering my first uh, contra medieval evidence. So this is going to be the argument from art history uh, as well as the numismatic coins argument. So this can place the shroud as far back um, to the 6th century AD or earlier. Um, so, you know, and then the second contra medieval evidence is going to be the three physical tests. Um, that Giulio Fonti came across, as well as that chemical, microchemical test on that Ray Rogers conducted. Um, and then next, we're going to be doing my the, what I think is the strongest is the Sudarium of Oviedo. Um, and then we're going to finish off with. Um, so originally, I'd planned to do a pro historical case, like trying to prove that it belongs to Jesus. But so much of the case. Uh, involves anatomical aspects of the wounds and that sort of thing that I felt that was best to leave that for round three um, and link that so that way we can have sort of the pro and cons. What are the anatomical accuracies versus Alan saying what are the anatomical inaccuracies and that sort of thing. Um, so we're going to leave that for this time and, and Alan's just going to provide his contra historical case, why it can't uh, belong to Jesus and or a, a, a first century Jew or something uh, trying to rule that out. So that's the the game plan for today's episode. Um, and just before I get started, um, one one little announcement on the Shroud series for you guys. So um, for, for you people interested in the Shroud, uh, after I'm finished, me and David had a bit of a discussion. So after I'm finished uh, doing the Shroud Wars with Alan, at least the, the three rounds. I don't know if he's going to want to do a fourth or something like that eventually, but we're going to take a bit of a time out um, on the Shroud because it has been dominating the, the site compared to other topics and that sort of thing. So uh, I'm going to take off from January to April, um, but then I do plan on finishing my series, um, you know, starting in May through the summer and hopefully get it, get it done so everything will be out there in terms of my Shroud argument. Um, as well, we're going to have Hugh Ferry uh, in a discussion with Barry Schwartz, uh, having a bit of a debate, like me and Alan. So that, that'll hopefully be sometime in May or June. And uh, Bob Rucker has agreed to come on and do an interview with us uh, again sometime in May. So, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's our plan. So, yeah, let's get straight into it. Um, Alan, did you have any introduction feed, um, like, feedback? Um, uh, obviously, this is your week, uh, Dale. Um, I, the two things I'm going to be talking about, which I, I think are really quite interesting, is um, to do with what we know about the crucifixion um, and how that relates to what we see on the shroud. Uh, and also wh what we know about how Jesus looked uh, and what we see on the shroud and whether there's any uh, disagreement there. Um, and certainly in my researches um, um, on uh, crucifixion, I came up with some amazing findings, which I, I, I know about at all. So I, I think that um, um, stay tuned uh, certainly for that, because um, there may be things that come up that uh, you've never heard before, <laughs> almost certainly probably have never heard before. So um, that'll be good. So um, yeah, th there is just one point I, i'll say it now right at the beginning dale and that is i i'm not sure at what point 
um, you're going to actually kind of divulge why you think um, that uh, this is a G belief authenticating events, as you put it. Um, you know, why is it miraculous? I mean, because we've we've um, had um, uh, other experts um, uh, say that um, they they can't think of any at all um and you've been asked previously you know give yeah. me three three good ideas any major points which point to that i mean is there going to be a, a, a great reveal at, at the end yeah yeah so so I, the reason i i'm purposely i haven't got there in, in my series so that that's why i'm purposely avoiding uh, giving the answers because I, I like to follow in, a, in the seat. So right now, you know, what we're doing is sort of following, okay, this this is cor this debate is corresponding to parts two and three in my Shroud series. Um, and then next week is parts four and five on the MRFs, plus a little of part, part eight because you're, you're going to be bringing in pro paint observations and that sort of thing. So I've I'm trying to go in order, and I know that's. I th where did you stop? You stopped listening to my shroud series after part six, I think, or, or was it? Uh, yeah, five? I'm not. I can't even remember that now. I must say. <laughs> but, so, so yeah, so that's that's why I'm limiting myself. And so far, in my series, I haven't got there. It, it will come up in this in the summer once I get to my conclusions of Criterion B. You'll hear why I think it's extraordinary, and it'll it'll start to come together for you guys as to why I think it's a Jeep Leaf that getting of that. But for, for the moment, I'm going to keep my cards close to my chest because I want to go in order. So, yeah, hopefully you don't mind being a little patient. But, yeah, all right, let's let's uh, let's get into it. Um, so the, the first argument that I have up is the what's called the art history and numismatic coins argument. Um, so this argument really started back in the early 20th century with Paul Vinyan. Um, who was uh, one of those uh, forensic experts who, you know, first started studying the blood stains and that sort of thing, and presented the anatomical findings to the French Academy of Sciences. Um, but he also did some research into on the historical provenance of the shroud based on various uh, odd features that are seen in Byzantine art dating from, you know, the 500s AD all the way up to the 13th century AD. And he noticed that there are some various similarities uh, that are odd and unlikely to, you know, there's no artistic reason to paint these things. So just to give you an idea, so what are we talking about? The, there's a transverse line across the forehead. Uh, there's a three-sided square between the eyebrows of the Shroud Man and it, um, a V-shape at the bridge of the nose. Uh, you know, there's the raised right eyebrow. Um, what else? Uh, two loose strands of hair falling from the apex of the forehead, uh, as well. Um, large open eyes, which we know in the Shroud Man now, they're actually closed, but they could appear as though they're owlish type eyes. Um, so this is the, this is the type of features that they're looking at and comparing to the Shroud. All of these odd features happen to be on the Shroud. Um, and then in the artwork from the Byzantine era during this time, we find these various uh, things. There's also a transverse line across the throat, which is usually interpreted in the, in the paintings as a, an odd fold in the hem of the, the garment around the neck. And, and that's not something, again, that we would expect um, to be on Jesus, um, just not just in terms of historically. Um, another another thing is the Hungarian Prey Codex. I just this is uh, the codex from 1192 to 1195. So again, older than the radiocarbon dates. Um, but there are a series of parallels there in terms of Jesus being naked, not common in medieval art. Um, his, his arms are folded. But most importantly, there's a series of poker holes or L-shaped holes um, in the prey codex. Again, another odd feature that's common with the Shroud of Turin. Uh, and I think make it more probable than not that these artists are copying a common source that has all of these odd features in them. Well, what could that be? That and, the, and that they saw as being authoritative. Well, what could that be? The Shroud of Turin is what I submit is the most probable option. You know, it follow, it's, it's simple, it makes sense, um, and I'll let Alan counter that. Now... Well, 
Oh, I'm sorry. You want me to do that now or later? Yeah. Uh, right. later, yeah. So let, just to go quicker, let me finish my entire case. And I'm, I'm condensing it for you so we won't go three hours again. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so quickly. Um, now, there's also the same kind of deal with the coins as well. And uh, various coins have Jesus icons on them. Some, you know, Byzantine uh, Sol Solidus coins, which are what they paid their soldiers and that sort of thing. So we have coins. Uh, Bob Rucker has a coin in his wallet uh, dating from the 11th century. There are coins from uh, the 10th century. Um, and our earliest coin, this is the coin that has the first depiction of Jesus, dates from 690. This is the Justinian II, the Byzantine emperor, sold his coin from 692 to 695. And what's interesting is that people, certain experts, starting with Alan Wanger, have done scientific investigations uh, looking at the points of comparison between uh, these coins and, and artwork and the Shroud of Turin, the Shroud Man in the Shroud of Turin. And they found anywhere between 70 to 100, um, some say, this is more questionable, but some say even as much as 200 comparable features have been discovered scientifically using uh, a polarized image overlay technique that Alan Wanger developed. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, and his, his quote, based on these specific coins, he found on one of the coins they examined 145 points of comparison. Um, this included features from bloodstains, wrinkles, and large numbers of flower-like images, um, which are very tiny on the coins. Um, on another coin, there was even as much as 188 points of comparison uh, claimed by Alan Wanger. Um, so this is incredible because with this polarized image overlay technique, it's important to note that... Um, Wanger lacked a sort of for, uh, like a um, a proper way, statistical way to compare this at the during the 1990s when he was doing this. So he adopted forensic um, methods in terms of points of comparison. So in in forensics, you can compare um, monotypic images um, such as a you know such as a fingerprint with as little as 14 points of comparison. That proves it's the same source. Uh, for polytypic images, like a face, uh, so this is what applies to the shroud, if you have as little as 45 to 60 established points of comparison, this is sufficient for our court systems to convict and for us to conclude this is the same person. If you're comparing a videotape uh, or a pit and a picture of some guy or something to, to the face. Uh, so this is how Alan Wanger approached it. Um, however, there's been subsequent work as well by Giulio Fonti. In, in 2015, Giulio Fonti and per, uh, Perindria Melfi performed uh, actual statistical investigations, um, and they provided in-depth, uh, again, on these uh, 692 AD coins, solidus coins. Um, and they found that the um, there's an based on evaluating the extensive list of coincidences, um, they actually performed a statistical evaluation on the whole set of coincidences and report in their study that the statistical calculations returned a certainty greater than 99.99% that the shroud was the model for Justinian 692 uh, gold solidus coins. Um, so, so yeah, I, th I think that that's sort of my positive case. Um, I'll turn it over to, to Alan to give his critique. Oh, right. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> I'm still waiting for you to provide any evidence at all now. Um, all you say, you're coming up with a, with, a, with a bunch of statements that don't seem to make any sense. First of all, let's deal with this comparison, points of comparison. Uh, um, really, uh, that's a mugs game. There is no way that you can, can come up with points of comparison to mean anything. Uh, for example, um, let's take the case of a car. Let's take the case of uh, a Mustang. It's got a steering wheel. It's got four tires. Uh, it's got an engine at the front. It's got a tailpipe. Um, it's got a boot. Um, well, it's got lots of things there. That, uh, it's got all of those things that we can say definitely proves beyond doubt that it was made by Volkswagen. 
it's stupid. At the, uh, it's, it, it's completely dark. There is no way that you can use this to prove anything at all. Um, you, you could say two eyes, nose, a mouth, hair, chin, um, tail. Yeah, except one's huge grey and has a trunk and the other one squeaks. I mean, the, it you're not actually proving anything. All you're doing is trying to come up with some really poor pieces of facts to support um, a conclusion you've already come to. And that is that you think that the, uh, the, 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 the image on the shroud is the thing that uh, people are re relating to it. I mean, fundamentally... The, the 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 shroud image, as we know, was was created around about 1350. Um, uh, much later than the the, the, the coins, etc., that that uh, you're talking about. So, how on earth can something in the future be um, be used? What 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 we could <laughs> minute, what, what we could do is we we could say that the Egyptians got their idea of pyramids from looking at the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. Well, of course, they must have done that because how on earth would they have come up with the idea of building a pyramid? Well, because they, they must have seen pictures of the Luxor Hotel. It's absurd. It's just really utterly, completely daft. <laughs> Have I got my point across? And then the other thing is you're seeing things that aren't actually there. You know, things like those poker holes and the prey codex. I'm sorry. But this is, this is uh, isn't it, what is it called? Paridolia, is it, when you're seeing things that aren't there? It, yeah. It's You're seeing, trying to find patterns where the patterns do not exist. Um, and then holding that as evidence that... Um, that these things occur. So, no, I'm, I'm not impressed by this um, uh, at all. And as far as the Prey Codex is concerned, um, you know, the fact that that you've got these these UC poker holes that have a particular pattern that you can also see in the shroud. Well, the Prey Codex doesn't show the shroud. There's a picture of the, the shroud on the Prey Codex. Doesn't have any image of, of Christ. Doesn't have any blood. You'd think that if they'd managed to figure out that there were poker holes there, how could they miss the, the image of, the, of Christ? I mean, it's it really is completely absurd. Okay, there you go. So, perfect. So, so I counted three sort of comebacks here. So I'm going to respond. So the first one is just ludicrous and ridiculous, uh, in my opinion. Um, so there's there's no way the points of comparison are just stupid that's garbage nobody would believe that it's like compare well they, each car has four wheels and that sort of thing so the points of comparison in, in the first place that's not how they work it's not just macroscopic features it, it's sort of it's in-depth detailed points it's so it's not it's not even as large as the odd features that i was originally talking about um but Okay, let's let's just say. So, are you saying all of modern forensics is BS? We we can't take fingerprints. No, I think well, well, uh, what, this is what you were saying is that is that uh, forty five to sixty uh, points of comparison are sufficient yeah. uh, in law to, uh, to convict somebody or something like that. Is that uh, I. Personally, I, I doubt that. But it, it, in any event, you've already stated to me that um, if something is 50.001% probable, it is proven. Well, no other person on the planet other than you thinks that, Dale. It's, this, is, this is, again, these are absurd ideas. I mean, a Julio, anything that Julio Fanti says is, is rubbish. <laughs> he isn't concerned with proving, uh, with, with, with uh, uh, proper um, uh, deductions uh, and uh, from science, he's already made up his mind what he's going to to um, to to, uh, to say, uh, to, what what conclusions he's going to come to. That's the way that he works. Julio Fanti is somebody that, that has set his store to prove the shroud is real, and he will do anything to do that. So, uh, I, I'm sorry, you're not you're not you're not impressing me here, Dale. If, if, if you're going to so. come with some de decent evidence, fine. But th this is just well. Okay, so, so, so let's, let's hope it gets just... better from now on because this is rubbish. 
Okay, so so just for the record, that that's fine. This is Alan's opinion. So he has ad hominems for Julio Fonte. So Fonte is the one that does the statistical argument. Oh, it's, oh, it's but, not but, it's me that's but, got uh, no. I think you'll find that Barry Schwartz also yep, thinks that Julio yep. Fonte is a, a, a pseudo scientist as well. well yep. and I've, I've said so on your program. But yep. anyway, we're going to come on to Julio a bit further, a bit further on. Shall we come? Yes, uh, but so so I just want you to understand. Alan is saying the court, the legal forensics, CSI type stuff is nonsense. When they link faces through forty-five to sixty points of comparison, that's not science. That's pseudoscience. So our court system is a sham. Our our all of the forensics is a sham, according to Alan. So have that in mind when you just dismiss the evidence. No, I'm not, that, no, I'm not saying it's it's pseudoscience. What I'm saying is. That um, w what you say that is is is, is something that would be pro proven in court of law isn't absolutely nothing to do what we would consider to be proven scientifically, and that's that that is something as you know is something completely different. So so it's it's it, it is insufficient. I mean. The, what you're going to get is a normal distribution curve and a probability uh, based on on those particular areas. But of course, it 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 assumes you haven't uh, loaded the dice to start with. <laughs> so, what okay. about all the points that don't fit? <laughs> what the, okay. Do you so just ignore them? Okay, uh, so I'm moving. I got a. I've got three points, right? So let let me finish that, so we don't. Um, Okay, so good point. So that's our, our difference on the points of comparison. I've provided uh, sources for you guys to check out on that to see if you believe it or not. Um, this, the second objection, I didn't understand this is, uh, so we know that the Shroud is medieval. That's just an assumption on your part. We don't know that the Shroud is medieval. That's that's the point. Well, but let, let me say, no, no, that's, no. it's only um, kind of... Uh, religious fanatics who think uh, otherwise. Uh, the, the, the the consensus that the, the consensus of the scientific and, uh, and history establishment is that the shroud dates to 1350-ish. It is. Which like where are you getting this consensus from? <laughs> well, uh, okay, so. Um, it, name any um, um, mainstream scientist who, who disagrees with the findings, the C14 findings. Name an, um, uh, an a historian, um, a, a proper historian. <laughs> See, I can't then, because you define what mainstream and proper is. But still, I don't have to do that. You're claiming that you know the consensus agrees with the carbon-14. So, okay, sh show me carbon-14. We, we can, no, we can't. Okay, so again, but Sorry, all I'm, I'm, I'm saying is is you're, you're trying to deny the fact. Is you're, this is exactly what flat earthers do all the time. They, 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 they deny what, what has been established uh, in science. We know that, 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 that carbon-14 data Dating is the established method of uh, uh, of dating uh, organic material. Um, some of the top um, uh, uh, laboratories in the world have come up with an agreed date, um, which has never been questioned by the scientific establishment. Only by people who who, are, who believe the shroud is real. No, Did that's not true. I, I gave peer reviewed sources of people questioning it. Uh, pe uh, you know, people, Robert Hedges, people involved in it. I, I gave, I, I dare you to call Garmin Harbottle, someone I quoted in my part one, I dare you to call him a flat earther, one of the inventors of the carbon-14 methods, like Harry Gov was for his own method. Uh, Murdoch Baxter, he's a flat earther. That These are unfair, these are secular scientists, nothing, no, they're no, not okay. no, no, well, <laughs> as I say, <laughs> Everybody that, that 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 comments on on this says exactly the same thing, which is that um, you didn't like the, the the results that were presented in, in 1988, and and uh, all the things you're going to be talking about now is is a really pathetic attempt to try to to um, to um, say that they weren't accurate, whereas everybody else has moved on. 
it, it, it's a fait accompli. We know that it's medieval. And, and all of the things I'll be talking about today will be showing there is medieval. Everything points to it being medieval. So, uh, I mean, uh, in a way, I, I think we need to get away with what happened on the last uh, show. Yeah, I, 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 do re re I think that people should listen to that and also uh, the comments um, that, yeah. that, that, that yeah. were raised there. We, so we don't cover the same area. But yeah. the, the, what, but with, just, with this, all I'm saying is that the, it, it's a complete mugs game to attempt to use points of comparison um, in any any way to prove anything. Okay, we yep, we so we've moved on past that. So all, all I would say with uh, just as a last thing, because and it's I don't want it to get heated. This is my fault. Sorry. Um, with with, with the, the last thing on the pseudo scientific nature and the carbon fourteen, the consensus argument. Um, okay, so I, I provided quotes of about nine to eleven. If you can provide quotes in a comment from five carbon fourteen scientists or secular scientists in that field that aren't weren't involved with the with the carbon fourteen dating in nineteen eighty eight, um, then I'll consider that great. You you've established that. You haven't established it, but I'll concede that, okay, well, you've got I, I, secular. I, I, yeah, but you know that what the, the, there were supposed to be seven labs involved in the C14 dating. Only three of them were actually chosen. Um, so if there was anything wrong with the C14 dating that the three labs came up with, what you would have expected the other labs that, that whose nose was had been put out of joint to have actually mentioned it. Everything we know... Um, um, Harry Gov um, saw the Arizona uh, uh, procedure. He agreed with it, as well as the people in Arizona. None of the other um, uh, uh, labs has ever, ever um, um, pointed out the, the the problems with the um, um, with with the testing. So, so okay. you know, it so showed me in radiocarbon any uh, any stu studies that have been done that 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 you know the point to it being um, a a problem. The the actual that that you know there's a there's the, the, try, try to wrap that, up because we're on carbon fourteen again and again it's yeah, my well I know it's, all right so let, I mean I think we've covered this but you can get on to the, the you've got loads more to say yeah. so here here's your final objection and this is relevant so the the poker holes um, issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, this is something I mentioned in part in my part two podcast that people will say, oh, it's just part of the decorative design. It's not the L-shaped holes or something like that. Um, I think this is improbable, and I address that in the show because it's in the precise location corresponding to where it is in the shroud and in the same same shape and that sort of thing. That seems unlikely to just be a random decoration uh, that's not de replicated anywhere else on the cloth. Um, to, to my, honestly, to my mind, it is, um, unlikely as an option. And I will admit, concede this to Alan, that there are the same type of holes on the wings of the angel. Um, and that is a decorative pattern. So that lends some support for Alan's case, but it's just the location. It, it, it doesn't come across like look at I, I provided sources in uh, my part two podcast look look at the picture for yourself it it doesn't come across as just a decorative design yeah, it's well, when I I should also say that okay fine look at that please do look at the picture um what you, essentially what you're saying is that somebody uh, um, saw the shroud um close up made particular note of, of uh, some of the holes, duplicated the holes, but failed completely to notice there was an image on it. <laughs> if you look at the Pray Codex, is there an image of Christ on the shroud? No, of course there isn't. <laughs> Well, but that's the obvious thing, isn't it, dear? How could they? Yeah. How could they pick up the holes and miss the image? <laughs> What's the probability of that? It's Jesus very was low. Happy. Jesus so, is in the upper corner, right? He hasn't been wrapped in the shroud yet. That's why there's no image because he isn't put in it yet. So the lower panel has just the cloth, and the upper panel has G has Jesus in the in the uh, in the precise arrangement that he is displayed on the shroud with the arms crossed over, um, 
And uh, yeah, so basically just to, to quote an expert, because Alan was mentioning about textile authorities, meth child Flora Lindbergh, I quote her quite a lot in my series. Even Harry Gov and Michael Tite were discussing bringing her on back in 1988 as one of the textile experts to um, bring on. So they recognized her authority. Even they recognized her authority. So I'm quoting her. She she was in charge of the 2002 reserve, preservation uh, project uh, from the Shroud. This is her expert opinion when it, with regard to the Prey Codex. Quote, unquote, the painter of this picture must have seen the Shroud of Turin. Otherwise, it's not possible because it contains exactly the signs which we find on the shroud. Um, so, I mean, and it, it, there's other comparisons as well, like the herringbone, the geometrical herringbone weave of the cloth is present. Uh, I don't buy it. It certainly isn't. There is no herringbone weave on the Prey Codex. It's only shr a shroudist who, who can see this. Again, it's pareidolia, isn't it? Again, you, you're seeing things that aren't actually there. If you want to see a good example of a copy of the of the uh, herringbone weave on the shroud, we, I already covered that last time because yeah. it's on the, the, the medal of Lyrae. It's a very, very good example of, of uh, herringbone weave. There is no herringbone weave on the Prey Codex. Okay, cool. So, so yeah, I think that covers all your objections. Um, yeah, we, yeah, um, I, I've given the quote from Matt Child Fleurlenberg, a noted expert in the field, a textile authority, um, that even shroud skeptics like Harry Gov and Michael Tite respected. Um, okay, cool. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that that argument. Um, did you want to move on to? Oh, yeah, no, 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 yeah, I wasn't expecting to say as much as I actually just already done, but yeah, yeah carry yeah. on. Yeah, no, I, I think it was good actually. I think. Um, all right, cool. So, so the next argument. This is this is sort of uh, what I consider a, fl a fluff argument. It, it's it's an argument that's not going to be as strong. I'm, I'm bringing it up as a supporting indicator or um, yeah, historical indicator evidence in the same way that I see Alan's medallion. Um, evidence. So I'm trying to mirror the strengths of his his arguments and reflect my case accordingly. So what what is this? What am I talking about? So um, basically, Giulio Fonti, in the first place, has created, has done um, three physical tests using it. So Barry Schwartz got it wrong. He said it was only two. It was actually three. So he used Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, or FTIR, um, and using this to date the flax fibers of the shroud, he got a date of 300 BC, plus or minus 400 years. Then here's the other thing he used is Raymond spectroscopy, and that gave a date of 200 BC, plus or minus 500 years. Uh, and then the final physical test was a tensile strength uh, test of the flax itself, and that gave a date of 372 AD, um, plus or minus 400 years. So... What Fonti did is he combined all three of these dates, uh, and he, that gave him a stated, um, uns the stated uncertainty values were within the two sigma values, uh, which gives you an equivalent of 95% probability range of certainty. Uh, that, the shroud, dates from 33 BC, plus or minus 250 years. So that's, that's the date of the shroud, given these three physical tests uh, combined. Um, and remember that 95%, remember that's a necessary standard. Um, the carbon 14 guys tried to get that as well. Um, now the other test very quickly is there is also a microchemical test done by Ray Rogers. Again, uh, comparing the, um, the, the shroud fibers and two other ones such as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and again, we know the Dead Sea Scrolls are from 250 BC to 70 AD. And what Rogers found is that they are quite similar uh, from a microchemical perspective to the fibers from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this, uh, according to him, would indicate, okay, this gives us a date indicator that we can date it back to ancient times as opposed to the medieval period. So, yeah, there's not really a lot, lot to say. I'm probably going to agree with much of Alan's critique on, on what he's going to say, so I'll turn it over to you, Alan. <laughs> Why did you bring it up then, Dale? I don't know. Well, I've got lots to say. Yeah, which, um, 
All right, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it just for the sake of it. But it, it, if you if you're not really sure about it as an as as an example of of um, of, of good science, then it, I, it's almost hardly worth me going through and, and critiquing it. Uh, but fundamentally, I'll go back to this ch- uh, carbon fourteen uh, again. Oh no no. Uh, no, I'm just going to mention in okay. passing that. With regards to dating anything, um, as far as uh, 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 organic things are, com- uh, are, um, are concerned, um, carbon dating is the standard method of doing it. It's been tested and proven to be uh, correct, you know, hugely. There are tens of thousands of, of uh, carbon-14 tests done per annum. Now, with regards to the the tests done by by Ray uh, Rogers um, and by Julio, well, the number of people, well, it's just them. They've just made it up themselves. But I'll go into I'll, I'll go into the Ray Rogers of uh, Vanillin uh, first. All right. So what he's trying to do is trying to come up with a with a dating of the um, of the shroud. Um, that doesn't depend on carbon-14 because, well, he just doesn't want to believe in that. So he hasn't got any evidence that he doesn't work, but um, um, uh, at least none that, that, that actually holds up. But but um, anyway, it, it, when he was trying to detect presence of vanillin, Rogers used the, the Weissner test. Now, this is a classical method to detect the presence of certain molecules in the composition of lignin. Vanillin is one of the molecules that responds to the Weizen test. Unfortunately, it's not the only one. And guess what? These other molecules are found in lignin composition. Rogers' Weizen test is therefore not a specific test for the presence of vanillin. Um, how on earth could a, a chemist fail to have made this analytical chemistry error? He was, of course, dying at the time so um the the the, the report that he presented in uh thermochemica actor which um, is scientific secular peer-reviewed scientific journal just just to give some context to that so yeah yes the context is that he he presented it in his own journal the journal that that he was a co-editor of who's who's uh, f- the first report of which was his report that he was uh, that was on the board uh, all the way up to um when he retired yeah i think we'll find out the, just how pseudoscientific this was um and <laughs> and and, and that the peer review was a joke right so um, so, in any case, he made an absolute howler when it came to the method of dating he proposed. Uh, the Weizen test for lignin is still positive for the rays and uh, carbon-14 sample areas, uh, whereas it, it, it was not for the surface fibres of the shroud. Um, well, this is w- what he was saying. And, and pray, where did he get the surface fibres? I mean, he's, he, this is little, these little sticky tapes of, of plastic being handed around um, from from one person to the... You know, no one knows uh, um, the provenance of these things at all. He was doing this in his bedroom, for goodness sake. Uh, <laughs> it was just hopeless, it was. Anyway, um, there are standard me- methods of dating used in I- history and archaeology. Thermaluminum essence for crystalline materials, carbon-14 for carbonation materials, dendrochronology for wood materials. There are standard methods of dating, but he wasn't using a standard de- test for dating. Um, Vanillin lignin is, is, is used for dating nothing. If this method of dating is completely new, it must provide serious guarantees of its reliability for comparison. It was not until 1983 in a study conducted by four laboratories coordinated by the British Museum to ensure that the new technique of carbon-40 measurement for mass spectroscopy was perfectly reliable. So what guarantees does Ray Rogers bring? Nothing. Rogers invented it as part of a pseudo-scientific attempt to prove the shroud dated to the first century. The time taken by lignin to no longer react to the Weizner test was established for only three temperatures. 
Uh, uh, let me just explain that that what we're saying is that over a period of time, um, vanillin is 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 going to uh, deteriorate to the point where it's it's no longer present. So he was trying to attempt to use this as a method for dating the shroud. Um, you know, uh, so he comes up with it for three for for, for three data points. Um, 40 degrees centigrade, 70 degrees centigrade, and 100 degrees centigrade. And it is with these three values that Rogers determines the kinetic load of degradation of vanillin. He therefore uses just three experimental values to check a two-parameter effect. In other words, the bare minimum. Rogers calculates these two parameters, but does not indicate any margin of error for their values. Finally, it is impossible for anyone to check the values provided by Rogers. The experimental data from which he determines these values are not specified, and he doesn't provide any bibliographic references. Unavailable source data, missing error margins, minimal kinetic model verification, Rogers' article therefore does not meet even the minimum requirements of scientific publication. Yet it did get published, didn't it? It should have been thrown out. But let's go further. Rogers shows the time required for vanillin to degrade by 95%. Well, why 95%? He just plucked it out of the air. <laughs> he doesn't give a, a, any indication why it should be 95%. But with these assumptions, Rogers can get to a range of 1,300 to 3,000 years old uh, for the shroud. Sorted. Rogers achieves a pseudo scientific objective. But let's wait a second. If you look at Rogers' ana analysis, it's clear that just one degree centigrade in the assumption reduces the vanillin by 15%. If the shower was kept at a temperature of 10 degrees, it would be 17,700 years old. If the cloth got to 200 degrees centigrade, it would only take six minutes for the vanillin to go. At 300 degrees, just one and a half seconds. We know that the shroud has been subject to substantial thermal shock. The burn marks on the shroud are due to molten silver dripping onto the cloth from the case in which it was kept. Silver melts at nearly a thousand degrees centigrade. And let's not forget that many shrouders believe the shroud image was formed by high energy radiation. It was newt. Uh, Anti-authenticists such as Colaberry hold to an oven being used in the image of creation. Well, in any event, um, um, in order for the, the, the fibres uh, to become dehydrated in the way they are, they would have required heat. So Roger's conclusions, are, well, that, they're just absurd. So what have we got? Unreasonable comparison of fibres of distinct origin, analytical chemistry area, absence of source data and bibliographic reference, absence of error margins on numerical, numerical values, arbitrary choice of threshold value for the bias and the test, absence of account for service phenomena, etc., etc. So it, this was, this was, how could this possibly have been peer-reviewed? It was not peer-reviewed. Indeed, uh, I, I'm not sure whether I said it. I should have said it last time. The, um, uh, uh, after uh, Ray had died, um, um, a, um, uh, a, a report um, uh, 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 was, was, was published by Thermo uh, Attica, um, which claimed, which showed all of the, 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 the inconsistencies and poor science and pseudoscience and actually said pseudoscience in it that, that um, Ray Rogers was, was producing. And this was, this was published in Thermochemica Acta, right? So, yeah, they should have thrown it out, but they, they published a report saying it was rubbish. So, so um, I think that we we get, seeing through uh, things there. We, we can definitely say. Oh, I, don't, I know that Barry Schwartz thinks how great he got it published a thermochemical actor. I think somebody turned a blind eye, but this is just typical. Um, 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 uh, Barry has, has made it clear that as far as he is concerned, any of the um, uh, the experiments that have been done post nineteen. Uh, 78 uh, 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 pseudoscientific uh, you, you know that is all analysis done by um, shroud researcher 
And of course, you know, just, uh, Julia Fanti being the, the, the clear case in point, and I could just, go just, on. No, I'll let you go to Julio Fanti because you haven't covered him. But just, just quickly, because you, you mentioned that in the last debate that Barry said that all the peer-reviewed after Sterp was rubbish. He never said that at all. I mean, he, he links to the, to the two articles by Rogers and stuff like that. He says that there's a lot of pseudoscience that has gone on in both sides, of which he, he would include the, the Fonte things that you're about to talk about. But don't, it's not fair to say he says everything is all rubbish. That would include the 1988 nature then. I guess that's pseudoscience in Barry's opinion too. Obviously it is. But I mean, that that's not what he said. I just wanted to clarify that. He said there's there has been a lot of pseudoscience in, that's gone on in his opinion, but not everything is pseudoscience. Okay, uh, if that's um, true, then uh, I'll stand corrected on that. Um, you know, these are the sort of things that you, that you think you hear. Um, I'll go back and check, of course. Um, but 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 you must agree that um, that that Barry did highlight Julia Fanti yep. in particular, did he not? Well, when uh, he started he didn't talking. name him, but. Uh... He said, he's like, I know the researcher involved, but it's... That's it's, right, you've got over this. So exactly, no, he not knew what, what he was called, but he, wouldn't, he wasn't prepared to mention his name. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we yeah, know who he is, There's a reason for that. <laughs> not friends. I just not friends. He slagged everybody else off. I'm so surprised he would. <laughs> yeah, so, so go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, uh, are you... What yeah, you I, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I have got quite a bit to say why I don't think that, that, that Julio... Um, uh, provides um, yeah, share, share for the audience, right? Like the audience wants to learn, so go ahead. I know, but we. Have the, I'm thinking of the time factor. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so to you. I, I'm, I'm, it may be if we if we come on. I mean, so much that that um, Julio um, that talks about completely out of his area of expertise, of course. <laughs> like you know, anything to do with blood or coins or or you know uh, uh, measuring dating due to to um uh, 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 stress tests on, on on linen i mean yeah you name it he's the expert you know or, or, or supposed expert on it um um his articles have been thrown out of um of um uh, scientific um uh, journals and um and i could explain why that is um, uh, but, uh, and if we get time, yeah. okay. I'll, I'll go through some examples of that. But, uh, okay. you know, so, all I'm saying that, it, that there are, there are, there are those that, again, Barry Schwartz is, is, is saying that, 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 that these things are occurring. Um, and, and, well, I'll put it, I'll put it the way that, 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 um, um, Colin, Colin Bell, Barry, um, um Barry uh, puts it um uh, he likens it to throwing a dart and then painting the 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 the, uh, the, the dartboard on after the effect and they all look look that the dart is in the bullseye <laughs> yeah but it's 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 kind of one of those things that that if you uh, if you uh, uh, unreasonable comparison well no I don't think go over that particular point um, oh, okay. um, so, so I'll just end it off end it off yeah, end, end it on there and, and if we get uh, back to that particular yeah um, so so let me I'll just give my final take on based on your critique then so uh, lar largely I I do agree with Alan I I think that um, these these dating processes I'm, I'm not fully with them. I don't think they're rubbish I think that's uh, you know, I don't agree with the ad hominem attacks either. I'm, I'm not as against Giulio Fonte, uh, um, even though I would be, I would agree with Barry and Alan against Giulio Fonte on these results specifically. I, I'm not, I don't think everything he does is just rubbish. Um, so I'm a little, a little bit more pro. Yeah, but uh, no, no, let, let me finish my. Okay. My, okay, okay. Um, so, so yeah, so. Anyways, the point, the substantive point, forget about these ad hominem personal things, the substantive points as I see it. So on the methods that we're using to date and prove the shroud is not medieval, uh, do these three do these three physical tests and the chemical test by Rogers give us confidence in making that claim? I would say I would I wouldn't be comfortable. I would say 
it's an indicator. It, they're suggestive, perhaps, um, but they're untested. The, the validity of these methods hasn't been scrutinized um, in, in terms of other, uh, in the same way that other dating methods have been used to do archaeological artifacts. So I still include I would still include them as part of the evidence. The, this is data, scientific data that was obtained and published in respected uh, peer-reviewed journals with with uh, Rogers, uh, Alan alluded to that Fant Fantes was published in a journal, but that article was later retracted. Um, there, there are reasons for that. Um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't say this is proof, even on a balance of probabilities under my lenient definition, but I do think it's these are indicators that shouldn't just be dismissed. Um, the only thing I could think of to take Alan to task with is it this sort of notion about Rogers, oh, it's his own journal. Um, no, that's not true. He had nothing to do with the journal for over a decade um, prior to the publication there. He, he was involved with the journal, but uh, rather than get it, because I Alan made that response before and, and Barry gave his counter uh, to that. So people can find that in the comments. But the one thing I wanted to ask about is, is, is there a double standard? Because when we get to Macron, the same issue is is there with him. He published in his own journal at the time, at the very time, he was actually the editor of his own journal. Um, so if, if you're just going to argue, oh, well, this is just rubbish, like, why can't we just, is there a double standard there? And you don't have to give a long answer, just like a sentence, like, What's the difference? Why why is it yeah, okay? I, 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 and that is a, a fair comment. So I'm agreeing with pretty much everything that Dale is saying here with regards to, to science. Yeah, as, as far as these tests are concerned, we shouldn't put any faith in them at all until such point as they, they are replicated. Um, so... Um, if they are evidence, they are extremely weak. With regards to this particular point, though, uh, uh, about um, favoritism, if you like, um, yeah, I mean, you, what, I think, it, 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 yes, it's it's not good form um, to expect people to uh, accept your results if you if you're publishing in your own journal. Of course, um, this is something that that um, Ray Rogers had done right from the very beginning, isn't it? So, um, as I say, the first report that that Thermo Chemica Actor published was Ray Rogers' re report. So, um, it is done. But of course, if you want to, to be seen as squeaky clean, um, then you really shouldn't be doing it. Um, however, that's not the point. The point is whether or not there's any evidence that um, that uh, th th that these things were not peer reviewed. Now, we're, we've got huge evidence that Ray Rogers' report was not peer-reviewed because of all the mistakes in it. And that there were really very basic ones um, that, that were pointed out. It should, it, it, it should never, ever, ever pass peer review. And it seems obvious that Thermo Chemical knew that. Um, but um, as far as... Um, uh, 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 as um, uh, other um, reports uh, go, and I, I, I don't have a, an issue. Um, you know, if the, there's an internal procedure of you uh, of putting reports into into your own journal um, of of you know sort of a, a, like a, like a double blind test, as it were, you know, somebody somebody checks it without seeing who it is that's written it. Well, you know, unless you know what the internal procedure is, well, you're not in a in a position to criticise it. it. Do you have any evidence at all um, to show that um, uh, the the articles um, were not peer reviewed? And, and so that's the that's the important thing. So that's the difference. I mean, I don't see that it's anything to do with with the double standard. And it's exactly the same standard, isn't it? Um, uh, but in this particular case, we've got very st substantial evidence of really poor a peer review. Now, sometimes this does occur. I mean, you know, it, it isn't as if the, it, it was because it was a, a, um, a shroud supporter that, that this issue occurred. It's sometimes it occurs. Sometimes the, the publisher doesn't have the time um, to, to get um, uh, 
appropriate people to look at it. So ask the author of the paper to to come up with some names. <laughs> well, sorry, I mean, yeah, oh yeah, I know a few people that are going to support me. Then I'll get them to read it. You know, um, we've had occasions when peer review uh, reports have been put through. Um, been accepted, resubmitted, and failed. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, clearly, clearly, we do have a you know peer. Just to say peer review. I mean, you've said if something's peer reviewed, it's proven. I mean, scientifically proven. I mean, it, it is as far away from uh, from the truth as it is possible to be. I mean, if you can replicate the results, that's the important thing. So yeah. So, okay. Cool. Uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to challenge too much on that because I, I want that was just a sincere question on your your take um, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think okay, uh, yeah. One one thing I'll just add to that is so I, yeah, I've I've always said, I, I don't understand why people think I, like I've, I've explicitly said I don't believe peer review has to be taken as infallible. I, obviously, I deny. <laughs> Uh, the 1989 Nature peer-reviewed article. So, I mean, uh, I, I do recognize... Uh, here, here's one thing that's interesting, because I was talking about this issue with, with Bob Rucker, um, and he prefer. This is one of the reasons he doesn't want to go in for peer review, because the process is closed. We don't know the internal process, who who's peer-reviewing the these things, whereas his, his articles published online, you know exactly... He lists all eight of the people who are reviewing his work. You know exactly... Who they are, uh, he provides you know their comments and stuff, so you can see why they they're accepting or rejecting his work. So he actually prefers that over the peer review, where it's a more closed system. Because Alan sort of mentioned that, so um, yeah, we don't accept peer review as infallible, um, but it's it's that it's a good indicator if it, if it's there, it's. It's there for a reason and should be taken seriously. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't just, oh, well, someone was drunk when they published Roger's thing, but oh, then they came to their senses with the later article. That I, that strikes me as just being a little bit unfair. You got to look at the data and, and decide for yourself, like, like I have. Like I said, on the data, I'm on Alan's side. I, I don't think these are established methods, but they are indicators that I wouldn't just dismiss uh, it's it's waiting further confirmation, perhaps. So, so yeah, let's yeah. let's. Continue. Well, I'm not going to disagree for most of that. I mean, as Barry Schwartz kept saying, you know, all these things should be published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, well, and the fact that many of them are not makes you question the the, the results. But if 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 they've got nothing to hide, they should be they should be putting it out there. But anyway, there you go. Carry on then, Dale. Cool. Uh, so now we're coming to the the big baby, uh, my big baby. So this is the equivalent of the carbon fourteen for Alan. Uh, the link between the shroud and the sudarium of Oviedo. So, what is the sudarium of Oviedo? It, it's uh, a small blood stained cloth. Um, that has resided in Oviedo, Spain. It has a known history. It, it's been there uh, since uh, before 711 AD. Uh, it came with historical documents. So its historical provenance is certain. That it's undeniable. Um, we can trace it back at, at the very least um, 500 in 570 AD by Antonius of Piacenza, who wrote about the, the Sudarium being cared for in the vicinity of Jerusalem uh, in a cave near a monastery of St. Mark. Um, so, yep, Dam of Oviedo has a known historical provenance. We know where it's been uh, geographically. Uh, so here, and it's even been radiocarbon dated. That gave an, an erroneous date. It's funny, this this infallible carbon-14 method gave 700 AD, which we know, and even the radiocarbon scientists themselves admitted was wrong. Um, they attributed that to oil contamination at the time. But um, so, yeah, that's what we know. That's what the sudarium is. We know when it dates from or earlier. So when I'm saying 570 AD, that doesn't mean, oh, that's that's when it originated. We're just saying that's the first historical instance where we have a, a mention of it. But so it's it could be 570 AD or earlier. Um, so it's consistent with the first century AD date. I know some people were confused about that. So it's it's 
that's the maximum date or it's earlier. Um, okay, so so how do we, that's fine, how do we link the sudarium with the shroud? And for in, various forensic experts, uh, such as uh, the research team uh, for the Spanish Center of Synchronology at the University of Oviedo, Spain. Uh, this included four research, uh, five researchers, Cesar Barta, Rodrigo Alvarez, Almanudia Ardendez, Alfonso Sanchez, and uh, Jesus Garcia. Um, so they, they've done various forensic experiments and they've found various similarities between the sudarium and the uh, and the Shroud of Turin based on the body fluids and blood stains present on it. So in the first place, the full nose area is calculated to be uh, the same between the Sudarium and the Shroud. Um, one is being 2,260 2, millimeters squared, whereas uh, on the Shroud, it's 2,000 millimeters squared. And that's that little difference is just because of stretching and that sort of thing. There are superciliar arcs. There's a lack of imprint on the right cheek corresponding to the blow that is inferred at the point of the image on the shroud. Um, we can also tell that um, there's a swelling halfway down on the right side of the nose. Um, the chin and the beard have been measured based on the um, based on the what's the based on the, the fluid from the nose and the mouth. Uh, that's been calculated to be the same. Uh, what about the blood stains themselves? Well, the blood stains themselves have been determined to be of the AB type. Um, there are pre post, pre and post mortem blood stains that are geometrically compatible in size and their relative positions uh, on both cloths. Um, I've provided sources. There's, there's pictures. You can see this with your own eyes, uh, folks. I mean, you, you can see it. Now, um, yeah, the, these are basically how they, they link the, these are some of the main ways that we can link the shroud. It must have um, covered the same corpse at some point in their history, um, making it as old as these, making the Shroud of Turin as old as the Sudarium, because they would have had to cover the same corpse. So just to, um, and I'm not even going to cover the dirt comparisons, uh or the pollen analysis, the new pollen analysis that's going on, uh, just because those are a little bit more iffy evidences to use. Um, but here's here's my overall conclusion. This is from the forensic experts. This is their conclusion in their report. Fr quote unquote, from a, the forensic medical viewpoint, according to present scientific knowledge, um, even if research work, so Alan, you can take notes here, something you can use, but even if the research is unfinished as of yet, there would be no problem to convince a court of justice regarding the assertion that the Turin Shroud and the Oviedo Sudarium enveloped the corpse of the same person. Um, and then they speculate, namely in probability, that would have been Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. Um, but yeah, the main forensic point is that we have sufficient evidence to link these two objects. Therefore, the Shroud can't be medieval by definition. So yeah, I'll turn it over to you, Alan. Okay, well, with uh, most of these things, it, it comes. It boils down to the same thing: is well, we talk about forensic evidence. Are we talking about unbiased forensic evidence, or are we talking about people who have got a horse in the race? Because uh, what we're seeing here is 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 that is is that uh, we should be looking at the uh, people that that well. If you're looking at somebody that, that that's seeing it from another side, we had a um, forensic experts that, that showed that the blood pattern analysis shown on the shroud was obviously fake. Um, they'd be the people to look to because they would give a a um, a, a, um, a, a, a let me say, le yeah, <laughs> less that. less biased um, approach. I mean, we've got people that that not only have they got um, horses in the race, they've doped the horses. We, we, they, we, I don't, I, uh, you know, I'm not even going to be prepared to accept these things. You you just drop certain things out. Um, uh, originally, of course, um, um, the connection the connection to the sudarium um, is vague 
to say the least. To, you know, it, it, what's been happening is that people have been scratching around Wilson, namely, scratching around, trying desperately trying to find something that's going to back up the research, the 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 the. the, the the conclusions they've already come to on the shroud, and so he, oh well, how about this sudarum? You did, did you mention the fact that it's been been C fourteen tested? The Pass, yeah, 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 from seven hundred AD, yeah. So, so okay, it's a completely different age to the shroud then. So, hmm, well. It's not. It's it, a. It can't be. If it's if it's that age, it clearly couldn't have been anywhere near Jesus. And secondly, it's a completely different age from the shroud. Well, I'd have thought those those should be up up front and and in your face, shouldn't they? Why why aren't they? Uh, and and you mentioned uh, that um, uh, th- that the blood uh, has been. I mean, if you looked at it, please go and look guys you you'll see this smudgy mess and the, and we're back again to this idea of, of of points of comparison which proves absolutely nothing um except it it is said at one point you've said clearly that the the type of blood on the um uh, on the sudarium and the shroud is the same i a b mm. now that 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 would be a pretty good piece of evidence wouldn't it really but you only just kind of said it in passing um so who did the analysis there um who actually came up with the the idea that you know it's very difficult to prove there's any blood on the shroud full stop but hey no here we've got the the fact that it's a b blood so um well excellent so who who actually did this blood analysis uh dale yeah, it's in it's in my sources. You you can see the uh, the reports in there. Actually. Well, I mean, uh, were they different people? Were they were they were, was the, the the analysis done on the no. shroud done by one lot of people different. and the, the shroud? Yeah. It was. It's done by the same person, um, a guy called Baloney, isn't it? With <laughs> I think uh, I, I called it Baloney. <laughs> <laughs> it is below anything. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah. So somebody acting outside of his normal area, coming up with a blood test that everybody else failed to come up with prior to that. Adler doesn't doesn't uh, come up with this at all, and we're supposed to believe it. Yeah, joke. Sorry, not not impressed. So um, what? Um, I, I think Nickel provides a, a good um, critique of, uh, of 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 this um, um, supposed. Yeah. So so uh, you know, I, th- I the, the 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 main thing is the seven hundred uh, AD um, uh, test is the is the appropriate one, which shows that there's no connection at all. Or so okay, so case, not, case not proven. Okay. So I'll respond to your more the seven. Hundred AD thing, then if that so that's your most forceful. So just to keep it short, so uh, this is garbage. I, I'm sorry. Here, number one, here's why: the 700 AD date. You just blind. This is why you can't just blindly believe whatever skeptics tell you on the internet. The okay. carbon 14 scientists themselves, the ones that dated it, said that re- result is BS. They we know with 100 percent or 99.9999 whatever you want to say that that's not the date. Of the city. I mean, it's centuries earlier than that. We know that. And even the carbon-14 scientists that did the dating said this date is wrong. They they attributed it to oil contamination. I mean, this is at the conference that they presented the date itself at. Um, so that, that's not true. But as to, again, it, so I'm not going to get into too much detail, but you, you know that how did we still have this data point that it got to 700 AD? Um, and if it's not oil contamination, like what the carbon 14 scientists are going to say, is there a way that we can get that from 30 AD up to 700 AD, just like getting the shroud from 30 AD up to mid century and the neutron flux as per Bob Ruck, he's done extensive calculations. He, he's shown that you could actually, because it, uh, what's the, He's constructed a cur- a curve graph, as you know, right? Uh, there's a specific name for it that I'm looking for when we went over it. But 
Um, so yeah, this this is in his uh, part three article where he provides the different dates according to this curve, specific curve that we would expect the date. So the sudarium would we would expect to get a 700 AD date if it was placed off to the side um, in the middle of the chest. So it goes, it curves. It's like a bell, a lopsided bell curve um, is what you're looking for there. So. In the middle of the chest, if we carbon dated that, you would get way into the future, 8500 AD. Um, but down where they took the carbon-14 sample, that would be 1260 AD, just like what we got with the 1980 carbon-14. And for the sudarium, if that was placed on the side of the bench beside him, um, that would receive less less neutrinos, uh, less neutrons um, in the neutron flux hypothesis. So. There, there is a explanation as to how we can account for these dates. Um, I get that you're going to say, well, that's that's magic, therefore it's rubbish and that sort of thing. But there are ways to account for the data, and the data that you're giving is wrong according to the actual carbon-14 experts themselves. Um, so yeah, that that's my refutation. Okay, so, so um, okay, so uh, from memory, from this. Um, what you're saying is that there's a question mark with regards to the carbon-14 dating because of some kind of contamination that C-14 scientists are aware of. Or I need to kind of um, – I have read something about this. So, um, And, in fact, I've only just kind of mentioned it in passing because you brought up um, carbon-14 dating. So um, I'm not sure um, – on that, um, uh, if you're saying that there's evidence before that, what's the evidence before that that it existed before that? Historical documents. So I, you know, the, I gave the quote from Antonius. Hang on, let me. Uh, what's this? Antonius of Piacenza writes of it, and this is back in 570 AD. Um, we also have mention of it uh, being in. Uh, going through Alexandria, Egypt in 614 AD. So it, basically, it, it was carried out of the east, out of Palestine, to escape the Persians or the Sassanids empire. Uh, and then later on, it, once the Islamic empire rose, it was pushed increasingly further west until it arrived in Spain. Um, this, this is uncontroversial. No, no one denies the, like, the history that I'm laying out for the Sidarium here. Well, I, I'm not uh, since I don't know it. I, I'm not in a position to actually criticise it. So um, it's something that we'll we'll expect. Um, perhaps Hugh, uh, who's li probably listening in on this, to come up with yep. um, his his view on it. Um, I, I doubt. Yeah, doubt that he'll oh yeah. So the, oh yeah, the Bob Rucker issue. Oh right. So well, uh, neutrons neutrons are not magic. Um, Right. So if um, if uh, the shroud has been irradiated by um, neutrons, we should see the radiation damage that's being caused uh, by the, uh, by those neutrons. Um, so uh, obviously, I, I'm going to say I know you've got this really. <laughs> I, I can't even believe you, you came out of this, but um, why not? Nobody ever spotted the fact that the image was was on on the um, on the shroud to begin with. Um, it, oh, it's because it takes centuries for for um, um, the image to appear by radiation or something like this. Well, yeah, again, it's down to once you come start moving away from from stating magic. So then bring in um, uh, naturalistic uh, explanations. Well, then you've got to come up with um, some kind of support for those conclusions. I mean, yeah, magic's fine. I mean, you can prove anything with magic. Um, but if you're saying it's neutrons that, that's doing it, well, then are these neutrons produced by a natural cause? Every, every, all neutrons we know are produced by natural causes. Well, they, explain to me how that that actually works. Then, I mean, we, all that Bob these. is doing is is coming up with some crazy idea that you know, at a certain distance from the flux capacitor, the the the, 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 the due to time dilation effects or whatever, some 
some um, um, uh, uh, dating of the of the of the um, uh, of the uh, of the shroud and the and the dating of the face cloth um, have get different dates by uh, you know uh, well yeah fine it, but it, it's just nonsense isn't it so um, you can't really bring it out unless you've got some kind of physical evidence to support that. Yeah. Um, Rutgers I, I don't know what I've got to say about it, really. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so it's a cosine shape distribution curve is what Rutgers calculated. So it works perfectly. It gives you exactly that. You can see it for yourself. So look at uh, the part three article, uh, two, uh, part three, figure 11 and figure 14. Uh, you'll you'll see it there, and then corresponding, and the, the explanation is in the article itself. But that's if you want to see it with your own eyes as to what I'm talking about. It's a cosine shape distribution curve as to how the neutrons would affect the dating of these things, including this sudarium at 700 AD on the side, the right square box, because that's over to the side of the body. Um, so yeah, the, these things work. Now, in terms of what Alan's saying. <laughs> No, no, but they sorry, work. Sorry, they, God. <laughs> sorry, if, sorry if, I, couldn't, I couldn't have that. <laughs> if, okay, no, that's fine. So, yes, what I'm saying, is, it's assuming a supernatural mechanism in terms of the neutron, the radiation of neutrons and protons and electrons come out of the body. That's that's what's supernatural. But Alan is entirely right, and I, I haven't, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'm going to be addressing it in my series, but... There are naturalistic ways to get neutrons, right? There, there have been journal, uh, published papers in journals. It was retracted because of a conflict of interest where earthquakes or lightning strikes are said to emit these neutrons and account. These are natural. These are, I would call them shroud skeptics. Um, they, Even though they're, they believe the shroud was authentic to Jesus and that sort of thing. But they're saying it's not supernatural because an earthquake emitted these neutrons. It bounced all over the limestone caves and gave us the screwed up carbon-14 dating results that we have. Um, now that, that theory, I'm, I'm going to be refuting that. It doesn't make sense, uh, especially in terms of explaining, well, how do you get images then? You, that doesn't explain the images on the inside of the cloth um, as a theory, which is what I care about. But yeah, there are naturalistic ways to get these neutrons, as Alan describes. The only question is, okay, but would that account for the precise carbon-14 dates that we're getting? Uh, yes, do, do you have any evidence at all that neutrons were ever anywhere near the shroud? I mean, what evidence do you actually have? I mean, where's the where's the radiation damage on the on the on the fibers? You know, you, you, it's from you, the protons. Uh, sorry, that's, the, that's what causes the images. It's not the neutrons that cause the images. That's oh, just what accounts for the carbon fourteen. Yeah. But, no, 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 no. What we've got is these particles flying around, right? You're saying that, you know, this is what happens. You've got neutrons flying around um, and they smash into things and they break things. If, you, if you're irradiated, um, it, it destroys your DNA. It, it, it smashes through and it, and, it, and it wrecks things. These are physical things. So we should see the damage. So uh, no, the problem Protons don't. Protons would account for the super. So I don't. I, I so don't you're think you're saying it's protons. Oh, uh, well, the protons are short range, right? They they don't. Neutrons penetrate. They go through the shroud like 140 times, um, bouncing off the walls and that sort of thing. But protons wouldn't uh, breach the cloth or that sort of thing. That's why the images are superficial. Um, so, again, so hang on. I, I, so what? So you're saying that proton? It's not protons. It's neutrons that's that's creating. So we, we we not only do we have neutron bombardment, we also have proton bombardment as well. Yep. Um, but it's only the protons. So okay. you're saying that neutrons don't ever cause damage. They pa they pass right through the cloth. Uh huh. Bounce uh, off. They go through so, well, it. Like like neutrinos. Is that what? Well, I. <laughs> I, 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 I all, all I'm saying is, um, uh, and again, I'm not an expert in, in this. I'm just saying that that you. Well, and you, Bob Rucker you, is. You, you, you've come up with a yeah yeah I know you know, he's not a scientist but but, but he's a nuclear he, engineer. I mean that that he knows what he's talking about, right? He, well, <laughs> he's great in terms of. 
MCNP, right, the Monte Carlo Neutron uh, program or system there, that he worked with that for over 14 years. This is the top level stuff for the DOD, the Department of Defense. Like he, if you're just, you can't just dismiss what he's talking about when it comes to the effects of radiation. He knows what he's talking about. Well, I, I'm not. So, I mean, you're talking about a guy that's not produced anything in any peer-reviewed journal um and i'm supposed to just accept it i and, and read it, read I, it. all it's... i'm saying is uh, has there been any evidence of neutrons okay so i mean yes, I, 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 you know, you, you're bringing up neutrons yeah. as i see it what's going on here where, where did neutrons come up in the first place, they come up because that's the way that carbon-14 is produced from nitrogen, isn't it? It's, it, it, it's as a result of neutrons. So so it, 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 you start with a conclusion and you work backwards. At least you do if you're a pseudoscientist. And what's going on here is you're saying, well, how on earth do we, we uh, explain the fact that, the, the, that we've got the wrong carbon-14 dating? Well, we could. It, this could work That's if we have some kind of, of neutron bombardment, which, 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 which affects the, the amount of carbon-14 in the, in, in the shroud. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so but it's, it's kind of, you've you started with a conclusion and you've worked backwards. No, that is not the way you do it. You say, well, what's the evidence for neutrons? You, you kind of, you, where did you get the idea of neutrons? The World Carbon-14 Expert back in 1989 who published his peer-reviewed journal in Nature, which I think you read. That's where it started. Um, so the carbon fourteen scientists themselves. No, but there's no there's no need to assume that any uh, neutrons are have been emitted from the body unless you've got some evidence that they have, no. and you don't have any evidence that they are. So, it's pure no, conjecture, no. surely. Okay. Unless so, you've got some, I know you know I I've looked around. I haven't seen anything. Perhaps perhaps you can come up with some, or perhaps some people that are listening to this will will chip in and, and give me some examples of of where this um, neutron radiation um, has been observed or the effects thereof. Well, I, so I obviously, it, oh well, there there are scientific experiments testing the effects of this type of radiation. Um, but if you're talking about from within a human body, obviously that's a, a one-time event. Jesus rose from the dead. That that's a that's why it's a supernatural thing. But it, we're not. No, no, so no, 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 we're not talking about supernatural thing. That's that's the issue. The, what we're talking about is naturalistic things. We're talking about physical things, neutrons affecting physical things, linen. Right. There's right. nothing magical about that. If uh, unless you 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 you're going to claim, no, the image just popped into existence without any neutrons, without anything. Oh, look, there it is. You see, that's uh, so, well, so that's fine. That's ma that would be magic. But, yeah. but as soon as you start t treading on on our turf, you're going to have to get, come up with um, with um, uh, rationales. You you know, yeah, you, the fact unless you're going to have the magic. There were neutrons, but they didn't have any effect on anything. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a it's a way because one of the things you also said is you're talking about when these neutrons actually are only only work only moved in vertical lines. Well, yeah, have you ever seen your neutrons ever done that? It's yeah, it's absurd. I don't know. Okay, anyway, so, so yeah, so this is what you do in science, right? You come up with a hypothesis and then ways. That, that predictions that can test or falsify that hypothesis. You are aware that they've done that. We have the ability right now to conclusively prove if the shroud was neutral, uh, scientifically prove in my definition of the term, uh, whether the shroud was, so it's not 100%, but it would be 99.99. Uh, there are tests we could do, non-invasive ones that could prove in my sense that the shroud was irradiated. They've come up with predictions and one of those predictions, this is why I give a yes and no, is that we would find the systematic bias um, in the 1988 carbon-14 data that Rucker has predicted given his MCMP analysis based on that cosine distribution curve. Yeah, okay, but my understanding isn't that they can they do that. What, what, if they had more C14 uh, dates around the cloth, then that would provide more conclusive 
um, uh, uh, sort of support for the ideas that that um, Rucker is um, is coming up with. But that's that's nothing to do with with showing that there's actual neutron uh, effect on the fibers of of, of mm -hmm. neutrons again uh, you yeah. know uh, it's outside yeah. of, of our, yeah. our clearly outside of our, our expertise to even <laughs> discuss yeah. no, no, this but, i i I'll think we ought to, back you up. I'll back to, up to talk about this in in the comments um yeah. if so you've got any other ideas on this it'd be great yeah. to have your so view I'll yeah just say, read number one read rucker's papers and not just his there's other there's others as well but rucker goes into great detail he gives detailed tables and graphs to explain how his theory works. But Alan, here's the no part. So I, my answer to him was yes and no. So I gave the yes part. The fact that we know there's a systematic bias could be an indicator. I, I, I wouldn't say that proves even on a balance of probabilities that it was neutron irradiated, but it is suggestive or indicative as a start. And then we have the neutron flux hypothesis. And that makes detailed scientific predictions. They've outlined it in their books on, on their theories of how we can, and submitted proposals to the Pope uh, to scientifically test this. Um, Rob, Bob Rucker himself has submitted official proposals to carbon. We, we don't even have to wreck the shroud. We have areas of the shroud that have already been removed in 2002 from certain areas. And if his, he predicts, if we could date that, it would give us a 3100 AD date, so in the future. And that, that would suggest his um, theory, hypothesis is true. They're, and they've come up with other detailed predictions which could falsify their the neutron flux, whether or not the shroud was uh, irradiated with neutron. But have, are we at that point yet where we can say, yes, it was for a fact? No. Uh, so that's the no part. We're, we're not there yet. but. We're working on it. This is why it's important to consider this as an option, just like considering Colin Berry's proposal and see how that works, or or consider Dan Spicer's electric charge. Yes, so, uh, but, uh, but as you know, scientists are not being allowed anywhere near the shroud, or uh, have been since 1988. Yeah. Um, oh, the church will not allow any further tests done on the on on the yeah. shroud yeah well and uh, you know that the, the, the arizona lab still has a bit of um the material left over from the the 1988 test it could use couldn't it it's, yeah. it's but, but that that they cannot do that because, without authority from the archbishop of turin and they're not going to get it no, no no it's the pope it's not the archbishop of turin wants barry was careful to mention that he he would want he wants more testing He's on their scientific advisory board. He wants there to be testing, but it's the Pope that has the ultimate authority. And for whatever reason, he's he's not giving it or hasn't given it kind of thing. So well, I, I, I yeah. know that it, it, it is owned by the Pope, but everything I read seems to suggest that the person that seems to have the last say on anything seems to be the, the Archbishop of Turin. Um, okay. And and Nickel points out that that um, the uh, uh, Cesare Nosgiglia Nosgiglia I don't know insists they cannot be authenticated. All the, the bits of um, tapes with stuff on can't be authenticated as having come from the Turin cloth. Um, the Archbishop's position provokes enthusiasts like shroud blogger Stephen E. Jones, who has. Mm. It's bad enough that he, uh, that this current Turin Archbishop is continuing in the telling of a lie about the matter, but it is even worse that he is in effect accusing Professor Fanti, yeah, that Fanti, of scientific fraud, as well as giving false comfort to shroud or anti authenticists like Joe Nickel and Zilk. In other words, we, we are. There seems to be a complete block, and I can see it from the church's point of view. I think the church thinks it's a fake, and, and therefore it, 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 it's between a rock and a hard place. He's got nothing to gain by having any further tests on the shroud, which are just going to back up what what science has already shown. So, but, well, I, I take Barry because he's an eyewitness, so I I believe what he says about about the inside dealings. Um, I think what he says is right, that the 1988 carbon-14 results did shake them and they're, you know, they don't they don't have any impetus to rock the boat. Hey, we, we can show this thing and we have millions of people that'll show up for any exhibition and, 
and not they don't want to rock the boat at this point. Um, so yeah, that's their fault. Uh, I blame them for impeding signs, just like I would blame uh, blame you know blame others in my series when I was talking about Harry Gov limiting stirp and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, uh, I guess I agree. I agree that we need more testing. There has been people that in 2002 there was the restoration project, and we took material. We have material. Yes, I know. Yeah, I know. We can yeah. carbon date that. They didn't even tell anybody they were going to do it. <laughs> no, it, it's sitting they just there. Did it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, but that would that would help prove Rucker's theory because if what he's saying is true, then that wouldn't give a t date of 1260. So if we got a date, carbon dated that, and got 1260. Boom, that would boost the case for the 1988 uh, results that it is medieval, as opposed to Rucker's, uh, you know, the cosine distribution, the the, um, uh, the the neutron flux hypothesis, right? So that's something we could do. It, it's already removed from the shroud. We don't have to wreck anything. Let's do it. Come on, Pope. If, if you're listening, please, let's do it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, that's right. my so should we that's tie fine. that up now so I get <laughs> some time to, to do my bit? So or, or have you still got stuff to... No, I'm, I'm, yep. I'm happy with that. So, so yeah, so now what we're going to do, um, so we're going to bypass uh, proving that on a positive basis that the shroud is belong to Jesus and or first century Jew until round three. So hopefully that'll carry, because I know the date's really important for you guys, so hopefully that'll get you guys to follow along to round three. Um so yeah, now what we're going to be doing is, well, Alan's going to be trying to prove that it can't belong to Jesus and or a first century Jew. It has to be later than that. So I don't I don't know fully what and what he's going to present present. So I'll turn it over to you to start. Okay, right. So um, as I said at the beginning, there's two uh, things I want to look at. Um, and I'm not going to touch anything to do with whether or not um, the image looks realistic. Um, we're going to deal with that uh, in the uh, in the next episode. But with regards to this, uh, uh, the question is, uh, and and Dale has brought out out this art history thing. Um, the question is. What does what we see on the shroud look as if it's medieval? Is it something that, that, that a medieval artist would have conceived? So one, I want to look firstly at, well, we know what the, the shroud image looks like. Everybody knows what Jesus looks like. He, he's the most painted figure in all the Western art, recognised everywhere as having a long hair and a beard. Indeed, that's the way the shroud depicts him. In fact, this familiar image of Jesus actually comes from the Byzantine era, from the 4th century onwards. And Byzantine representations of Jesus were symbolic. They, they were all about meaning, not historical accuracy. They were based on the image of a, um, an enthroned emperor, as we see in the altar mosaic of the, the Santa Budenzinia church in Rome. Jesus is dressed in a gold toga. He is the heavenly ruler of the world. The inspiration, undoubtedly, coming from the famous statue of the long-haired and bearded Olympian Zeus on a throne. A statue so well known that the Roman Emperor Augustus had a copy of himself made in the exact same style, without the godly long hair and beard. Byzantine artists looking to show Christ's heavenly rule as cosmic king invented him as a, as a younger version of Zeus. What has happened over time is that this visualization of heavenly Christ, today sometimes remade along hippie lines, has become our standard model of the early Jesus. Um, at this time of year, uh, we think of one man in particular. Yep, that's right, Santa Claus, Father Christmas. Consider our, consider our idea of how Father Christmas looks. Rotund, white beard, garbed, garbed in red, large black belt and buckle. I mean, surely that is how Santa has always looked. But that is not how he was depicted before the 20th century. He was often depicted as small and pixish. How else was he going to get down the chimney? Or he wore a, a tan or a green outfit. 
But sometimes ideas catch on. And before you know it, everyone buys into the idea that that is the traditional view. When early Christians were were not showing Christ as heavenly ruler, they showed Jesus as an actual man like any other, beardless and short-haired. There are no pictures of Jesus on the cross before the 4th century. By the 4th century AD, we see a shift in his depiction and we begin to have him appear with longer hair and a beard. After Constantine, we get this depiction of beard and long hair. In the first century Greco-Roman world, being clean-shaven and, and short-haired was considerably uh, considered absolutely essential. A great mane of luxuriant hair and a beard was a godly feature, not replicated in male fashion. Even the philosopher kept his hair fairly short. People in the civilised Roman world wouldn't be seen dead wearing a beard. Only unkempt barbarians did that. Indeed, that is where their name comes from. Barbera means beard. Barbarians are literally those who wear beards. I hate to think what the women looked like. A beard was not distinctive of being a Jew in antiquity. In fact, one of the problems for oppressors of Jews at time at different times was, was identifying them when they looked just like everybody else. A point made in the book of Maccabees. They had short hair and no or short beards. Uh, St. Paul goes out of his way to say that anyone with long hair is a disgrace. In 1 Corinthians 11.14, Paul tells us long hair is degrading to and unnatural for a man. Well, why would Paul attack Jesus if he, he had long hair? Jesus in Revelation is depicted as having hair like a lamb's wool. Lamb's wool is short and curly. It was a common characteristic of Jewish men to wear their hair in a close-cropped fashion. Eusebius um, copied the text of the Jewish historian Josephus in Against Appian. Uh, And in a particular section, uh, Josephus was quoting an early Gentile author who gave some unique grooming styles of Jewish men. Josephus shows that the Jews were known, as Eusebius renders it, for their close-cropped hair. At the time of Jesus, the Pharisees applied the scripture that the whole nation of Israel were to be reckoned as priests. That's Exodus 19.6. And they invented some strict customs, even for themselves and the common people, that were actually designed only for priests. And chief amongst those was the command from God that all priests had to have short hair. If Jesus had even slightly long hair, we would expect some reaction. Jewish men who had unkempt beards and were slightly long-haired were immediately identified as men who had taken a Nazarite vow. This meant they would dedicate themselves to God for a period of time, not drink wine or cut the, cut the hair. And at the end of this period, they would shave all the hair off, offer it up as a, as a fa- sacrifice in a special ceremony in the temple in Jer- Jerusalem. But Jesus did not keep a Nazarite vow because he's often found drinking wine. In fact, his critics accuse him of drinking far too much. Um, if he had had long hair, Uh, and looked like a Nazarite, well, we would expect some comment on the discrepancy between how he appeared and what he was doing. The problem would be that he was drinking wine at all. In a way, we we have a photo of how Jews looked in the first century. The Arch of Titus is a first century AD honorific arch depicting the sacking of Jerusalem. The Jews depicted thereon Well, guess what? They've got short hair and no beards. Perhaps the closest correspondence to what Jesus really looked like is found in the depiction of Moses on the walls of a third century synagogue, um, since it shows a Jewish sage um, who was imagined in the Greco... It was showing how a Jewish sage was being imagined in a Greco-Roman world. Moses is imagined in undyed clothing. His image is far more correct as a basis for imagining the historical Jesus than the adaptations of the Byzantine Jesus that have become the standard. He's short-haired. He has a slight beard. He's wearing a short tunic with, with, with short sleeves and a, a himation. 
So in summary, the, the depiction of Christ as seen on the shroud is merely the way a medieval artist would assume he looked, because by that time, that was the common perception. So uh, any comments, uh, Dale, before um, I go on to the next point? Sure. So, so on the long hair then. So I think um, I was trying to write down everything, but yeah, most most of us. So what Alan is saying is that most depictions of Jesus followed the Greco-Roman style, um, and this the earliest depictions came centuries after the fact. Um, so it doesn't really matter what they thought. I mean, of course they're portraying uh, Jesus in the Greco-Roman style. These are pagans making this uh, type thing. It doesn't necessarily reflect um, Jewish practice in the first century A.D. Um, as the Moses example is, is a perfect example. Do, do you honestly think the third century synagogue is an accurate reflection? Moses was actually clean shaven and uh, had short hair in that regard back in the you know second second millennium BC. Um, or are they just Hellenizing their depiction of Moses based on what they think after the fact? Because this can be an analogy. This is what I think is happening with Jesus. The Greco-Roman Christians are Hellenizing Jesus without any, there's no mention of what Jesus looks like at all in the Bible or anything, right? Because it's from a Jewish context. We don't have any really depictions of what Paul was like. That comes later, you know, him being knock-kneed or, and stuff like that, um, or, you know, appearing like a god at some times or that sort of thing. So Jews in general don't describe uh physical appearance, let alone of Jesus. It's just non-existent. So I don't think it's valid to use these later depictions of Jesus um, or Hellenized versions of Jews that, you know, some may have had shaved uh, things and that sort of thing. So who, who do I have to back me up, though, um, in, as historians? So the first is a Harvard professor. He's a world-renowned ethnologist, and he says that this does depict uh, is normative for shepherding Jews of the Galilean region um, to have the long hair and beard. You mentioned that the except also even before I even do that, there pretend it was the standard that you are right with these things. There could have been exceptions without mention, um, of course. I mean, there's no mention of what he looks like in general. So just because we don't have mention, oh wow, this guy looks weird. That doesn't mean he maybe he was the odd man out. But I don't even need to go there because I have, uh, and certain historians, uh, this is from uh, Drs. Gressman, Bolst, and Daniel Robbs, and I quoted them in my series as well, saying, look, quote-unquote, hair worn long, parted in the middle, and having what looks uh, to be a long, unbounded pigtail in the back is absolutely typical for Jewish men of ancient times. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess, like, do you, do you have sources from actual historians as well that you that you could quote well, that they... actual historians are just historians i'm i'm quoting people who are there dale yeah that's good i don't really care what but shroud supporting historians inverted commas think about these things i'm all, all I'm, uh, I'm i'm saying that we have quotes from the first century Josephus is first century. He says that Jews um, um, cut their hair short. We have Paul, who is first century, who says that it is a disgrace yeah. to wear your hair long. Yeah. These are first century quotes. Um, so, Maccabees so. is prior to the first century. That, that, that shows the Ju Jews were wearing their hair just like everybody else. Um, and the, 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 um, the synagogue, that, which was in the 200s, was saying exactly the same thing. So it doesn't look like anything had changed. So, okay. does it, so I, I think what all you're doing here is special pleading, um, and uh, trying to come up with some, uh, mm -hmm. some. Oh. So, no? so Maccabee, the Maccabee. Oh, are you quote wait, 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 wait. So, quote me somebody from the actual period wait, themselves? Wait, that's, so, that's what I'm doing. Okay, can I speak? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, the, so the Maccabees yeah. thing is totally irrelevant because we know the context of when that's coming. Um, the context of where that's coming from, right? Jews were being Hellenized. That's why there is the need for the Maccabean revolt. The Josephus quote, uh, I'm not going to dismiss that because that would be special pleading. So 
Do you know where in Josephus he, like, what, what quote are you giving? I want to look this up because I do have access to Josephus. Oh, well, it's a, it's a quote referring to Josephus. Um, and do I have it here? It is, um, Eusebius is the one that's um, uh, um, saying this, and it is preparation for the gospel, uh, nine, verse nine, section four one two b. The gospel, verse nine, section four. Four one two b. Oh, actually, is that right? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so yeah, and, so, he, and and he is referring to against Appian, which is Josephus, one twenty two, paragraph one seventy three to four. So, so uh, and what what was the against Appian? What? Sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> Hopefully, one, naming that. One dot twenty two, para one seven three dash four. Seven three dash four. Okay, uh, I'll look that up directly in Josephus. Then perfect. Okay, uh, so that could be some interesting evidence. I have to see what he actually says. The Paul thing is not good evidence as well. We know exactly what he's talking about. That it's sorry. No, why don't we think it's work for that? Go on. Yes. Yeah. The reason the reason it doesn't work is um, Paul's writing an occasional letter to the Corinthians regarding a specific situation. So people think this is about head coverings. You don't know what you're talking about. This is taught basically. Prostitutes in the ancient world were bald or sh had shaved heads. Um, it was that was what it was seen as. Uh, same with rich women, though they they would often wear wigs, very fancy hairstyles, and that sort of thing. So they would be shaved. Um, but apparently, their fancy, dancy things were getting in the way of people seeing in the church, and it was causing a complaint. So the women were saying, "Well, the heck with it. We're just not going to wear any wigs then." Uh, we'll just have, and that was even more scandalous. So Paul is addressing that. The head covering thing is, you know, look, you have to wear a, a wig. Um, it's not talking about a veil. So this is what it, what it's talking about in terms of having long, women have a long hair or a long covering. Um, men, okay, it's... Well, so Paul it's that. says that women, uh, women's hair is their glory. Yeah. Uh, and therefore it should be covered up. Whereas for men, well... Doesn't common sense show that that it's 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 it's, 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 it's disgrace for a man to wear? It, it, it's kind of like so. All all you're saying is is special pleading that oh, it only related to this specific. Um, no, one, the, this is what the text itself says. This is biblical scholarship, right? And it, yeah. it's the same word for covering. It's not like a covering like a veil. It's, it's the same Greek word, Koine Greek word for covering like if you took a curtain off and covered yourself. And it's an interesting thing that nobody understands is, well, why do uh, why do the you have to cover yourself because of the angels? What what the heck is that talking about? And what we don't know for sure. But the best interpretation I've heard is that, look, the, there's examples in the Old Testament where angels cover themselves in the glory of God with their wings. For example, they cover, uh, they have six wings or, or and that sort of thing. So they cover up, they use four of their wings to cover up. Um, and it's the same, the same thing that's going on here. So this is the same notion is you have to show respect. You're, you're causing disrespect to the, to the glory of God and, and the worship of God um, when you're not wearing wigs and you're just showing up bald like a, a common prostitute it, it's it's scandalizing the the church so that's that's the situation that's going on in first corinthians 11 i think that that makes the most sense and that makes sense of the greek words that are actually used so you can't use that to prove your point here but i will concede that the josephus thing might be a, a good point that i can't ignore so i, I will Fine. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just saying that you're special pleading, basically. But um, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, let's go on to the next bit. Otherwise, we're not finished. Okay. Um, uh, so the next uh, is. Uh, so what I'm saying there is, this is not the way we think that 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 uh, uh, Jews uh, had their hair in the in the in the in, uh, in the first century. Uh, this is something that that only would have been um, relevant to people in Middle Ages. Um, 
Uh, so the so next thing is to do with crucifixion. Now, I think this is really quite interesting. It's not it's totally connected with the the shroud. It, 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 in passing, it is, but I'm filling in the details because well, it just does seem interesting. So forget everything you thought you knew about crucifixion. As you'd expect, um, the artists who created the shroud in the Middle Ages portrayed the victim according to the views of that time. In the Middle Ages, we start to see depictions of Christ showing the marks of flogging all over the body, dripping blood, emphasizing the horror of the passion. But this is not how Jesus was portrayed earlier. Indeed, there are no pictures of Christ even on a cross until the 4th century. It is therefore no surprise that the shroud portrays a man showing signs of the passion, because but by the Middle Ages it was acceptable to do so. The first Christian image of Jesus dead on the cross, and this is according to uh, Frederick uh, Zugabi, is from the 9th century. The question is... Do the representations on the shroud agree with what we know about crucifixion? Well, first off, I have to say that the, the wounds shown on the shroud are completely unrealistic. But, but I have agreed to put off that discussion until the next episode when we'll look at the massive number of physical inaccuracies um, that the artist made. So, so what do we know and, uh, and don't know about the way someone in the first century was crucified? <laughs> Right, so after undergoing the pre-crucifixion torture, the, the victim was compelled to carry his or her crossbeam, uh, that's a, a patibulum, uh, to the place of crucifixion. Now, the Roman comedy writer uh, Plautus wrote, I believe that you will soon go out the gate in that direction, led with hands spread out on the patibulum, which you will have... Um, uh, which you will have, sorry. Uh, another source makes a similar statement. They, the convicted criminals, are bound to the patibulum. They are bound and led around and fixed to the cross. Even before the Romans crucified people, they, they, they were already tying people naked to a piece of wood, leading them around and whipping them. This was a form of punishment meted out on slaves, and eventually this led to this being included in the procedure of capital punishment. Once the victim had arrived at the place of execution, executioners fixed him or her and the crossbeam to a tree or a wooden post. Uh, Pseudo uh, Manetho, that's in the third century, describes how crucifixion must have looked. Punished on their tortured bodies, they see the stake i.e. the cross, as their fate. In the bitterest of torment, they have been fastened with nails to become evil banquets for birds and terrible scraps for dogs. Uh, I won't say where that's from. Uh, this brief description indicates that crucified persons were in a state of torture. They were attached to their crossbeam and perhaps a wooden post or tree by nails, and that their corpse often was left to the scavenger animals. Seneca describes a similar image. Can anyone be found who would prefer wasting away in pain, dying limb by limb, or letting out his life drop by drop, rather than expiring once for all? Can any man be found willing to be fastened to the accursed tree, long, sickly, already deformed, swelling with ugly tumours on chest and shoulders, and draw the breath of life amid long drawn out agony. Although this text indicates that death by crucifixion took a long time. But the ugly tumours were probably the result of the priest's crucifixion tortures. It is suggested that the criminal was elevated only just above his or own own height. If he or she was to be displayed to persons from afar, a little higher. But several texts suggest that the victim was kept low enough to the ground that dogs and other wild beasts could gnaw on the legs of the corpse. The crucifixion process had to be pretty speedy. As at someone, at sometimes thousands would be crucified in one go. According to Josephus, 500 in one day in Jerusalem. There is some indication that the central pole, the stipes, to which the patibulum was attached, was a permanent feature. 
soldiers would just lift the person onto the slot at the, the slot at the top. So what do we know then? We have several references to arms being stretched out. So no hanging from the cross. People died of exposure over many days. The bodies were left to rot. Some of the early church fathers thought um, uh, the victims uh, uh, died from um, hunger. So what are the, uh, are the incorrect, some of the incorrect myths? Well, myth one, crucifixion victims died by suffocation when they got too tired to repeatedly push themselves up on uh, the nails in the feet to exhale. And then this came originally from uh, a Pierre Barbet in 1953. Yeah. Well, you can't cry out at the moment of death if you're suffocating. But that's from the Gospels. Dr. Frederick Zugabi's crucifixion volunteers couldn't push themselves up even once to straighten their legs, let alone the thousands of time a crucifixion victim would have um, had to do to stay alive for hours all days on the cross. But the crucifixion volunteers experienced little, if any, reduction in breathing capacity with their arms elevated 25 to 35 degrees above horizontal. And in reality... As we've seen, victims' arms were probably closer to horizontal, which would influence breathing even less. Crucifixion victims were regularly reported to easily speak from the cross, not only in the Gospels. There are no reports in hundreds of writings on crucifixions in antiquity of victims having difficulty breathing. Myth two. The Roman soldiers regularly broke crucifixion victims' legs to hasten their death by bringing on suffocation. Right? The, the victim could no longer push up and therefore um, exhale. And there are no reports of breaking legs of crucifixion victims in antiquity. None at all. Even Wikipedia gets this wrong. The whole point was to keep the victims alive as long as possible. Shortening their death was <laughs> totally nonsense. Breaking the legs was a separate capital, a non-capital punishment in the Roman Empire that Constantine abolished along with crucifixions. It's separate punishment. It's nothing to do with crucifixion. Breaking of leg bones leads to significant blood loss that leads to death. The only reference we have is in the Gospel of John. Uh, in chapter 19. It is not supported by the other Gospels. Even scholars who are evangelical Christians pay little credence to the idea that you can get accurate historical information from John. He's making up a story to make a theological point. So, no spear in the side then. Myth three, crucifixion victims' feet were placed on top of each other, one nailed to the cross. So uh, this is not seen in any crucifixion art until about a thousand years after Christ. All early depictions of crucifixion for the first 500 years or more after Christ show the feet side by side. And that's wrong as well, as we'll see in a bit. There are plenty of pro-shrouders who will swear blind that the shroud shows the traditional one foot over the other with a single wound through the front of the foot. Myth four, crucifixion victims' hands were above their heads. All early, first 500 years after Christ, images of crucifixion show the arms out to the side. Early Greek and Roman descriptions of crucifixion talk about the arms being stretched out to the side. Even the Roman word for the crossbar, the patibulum, derived from a verb meaning to stretch out. Myth 5. Jesus carried a complete cross made of two pieces of wood. No one in antiquity of the thousands of crucifixions was reported to carry a T-shaped cross. They only carried the crossbar, the patibulum. Many depictions of crucifixion mention condemned men carrying one piece of wood to a place where they were placed with it onto another piece of wood. Myth six, crucifixion victims were nailed through their hands to the crossbar. There is no evidence that this was common procedure or indeed happened at all. Indeed, same goes for the wrist. The only part we were sure that Romans did nail to the cross was the penis. And perhaps that's why the, the man on the shroud doesn't have one. 
there was no requirement to nail the arms to the cross because the victim had already been tied there. The whole argument for the wrist um, centers around the requirement to support the body weight. Doesn't need to. (laughs) The ropes do that. And then we have the archaeological information. We have exciting. We have an exciting new finding this year. The new finding, the 2,000-year-old the skeletal remains of a crucified Roman, uh, was reported on Live Science, Metcalf, 2018. The article, June the 4th of 2018, described examination um, of the bones, originally discovered in 2007 near Venice, as revealing a lesion together with a healed fracture located on one heel bone. That this is discover, discovery is significant since it is consistent with the only other apparent crucifixion we known to archaeology. The earlier discovery came in 1968 with the excavation of a Jerusalem tomb bearing the inscriptions Johananan. That victim's heel bone was still attached to a piece of wood by a nail through the side of the heel. So corroborative evidence now of people who were crucified in the first century, both nailed through the heel bone to the side of the cross. No evidence at all of arms being nailed. In neither instance was there clear evidence of wrists being nailed, and it it is assumed in these uh, examples that they were tied. So no wrist hand wound, no spear wound, and nailed through the ankles. This is our best guess of how crucifixion was conducted. Uh, But this is not how we uh, see the image on the the shroud. So so we don't have any evidence of of, um, people being nailed through the the hand or the wrist. Um, It's it's conjecture. I haven't mentioned anything about um, uh, whipping, um, but I'll just say briefly in passing that uh, some uh, somebody, um, uh, uh, Andrea Nicolotti, has done some research on this and uh, um, essentially has found we haven't got a clue as to the implement, implement that was used um, to um, to whip um, Jesus at all. Um, the problem is with with uh, with um, the. the the flagrum um, is that it's just being organic. It, it, it just rots and that's it, the, the end. So we don't have that. Anyway, there you go. So I, I, th- I thought that was really quite interesting. Um, uh, uh, the yeah, one thing yeah. that, that I, I was amazed at was that um, there's no evidence at all that um, people were uh, had their legs broken. Um and then yet so many people think, yeah, everybody knows that. Uh, no, they don't. So, yep. Yeah. Any any comments, still? Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So in the first place, thank you very much. I, what I found interesting and didn't know about actually was the new archaeological find. So it, if you maybe in the comments would like to provide a source, I, I would be yeah. interested just to learn about that because I know about Johannan. Okay, so how am I going to respond to this? So most uh, many of your points are actually believe it or not to- even if i grant them are totally irrelevant to the shroud uh let, let me explain so myth number one about asphyxiation so yeah so uh, i'm glad you used my source because i linked to this source right you're talking about frederick t zagabi i think in part five pierre barbette revisited so the common claim that gary habermas uses and i think still a valid one i mean he did scientific experiments uh, quite a lot to prove this notion about asphyxiation, um, that it that it's uh, this would happen. Uh, this is why Mike Lacona and Gary Habermas still say this is the most probable way you would die on the cross. And Frederick T. Zugaby takes Pierre Barbet to task and says, no, I don't think he would die from that. He would die from hypovolemic shock or, or hunger, I think that was the thing Alan mentioned as well that sort of thing so he think he's taking it it's not asphyxiation that kills them okay who cares i mean in regards to the shroud uh the shroud doesn't say anything about how the guy died on the cross whether it was asphyxiation so uh i just see it as irrelevant um 
same with the legs being broken. Like if if you're wanting to attack the Gospel of John, that's fine. I, I'm not here to defend that today. I'm here to defend the shroud. Um, the shroud evidence suggests there are no broken broken bones. Let's even pretend you're correct. Uh, great, that's consistent with crucifixion then, uh, and consistent with the gospel portrayal that Jesus' bones specifically weren't broken. I don't care about the other two guys. Uh, for the purposes of the shroud, as a Christian, obviously I believe in the gospel of John, and I would try to defend that and stuff. Um, the spear in the side, so this is relevant, because obviously there is a spear wound in the side, um, but that's not a that's not a myth. I mean that that I forget what you're you just said. We know that. They, yeah, I'm saying that the, the the only story we have of of the of the spear in the side is the same story about the broken bones. Um, it's not. There's no um, uh, corroborative evidence from the other gospels. It's just John saying this, and and we have given all the other things we've 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 looked at. It doesn't seem very likely. Um, so uh, again, it's, the, the the shroud shows shows clearly a spear wound in the sign because that's what people were expecting to see um, from yeah, I don't think John. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't rate John uh, at all. Yeah, well, I, I just. Don't, I don't think you can prove that they the shroud being pierced in the side with a Roman lancia or something like that is improbable. So I don't. I don't buy this argument. It is true that it's only this incident is only mentioned in John. So if you want to try to make an argument against the Bible or something like that, um, yeah, but what I'm saying that, is that's we know the way that, that the whole idea of people being crucified is to to be left up there to rot. Yeah, I'm kind of, um, that I, is the whole point. Right. It is a slow, long, lingering thing. Yeah, and the whole idea is to be to show off to everybody. Th- this is what happens if, yeah. if you um, if you if if you take on um, Roman uh, the Ro- Roman um, uh, leadership, uh, um, you know. So yep. so You're, yeah. So so but, but John were there, never, were there say, never occasions where they had to ro- hasten someone's death on the cross? No, it, well, we, well, you know, exceptions where there were exceptions to this rule where they had to do it, and the Gospels provide one such exception, right? Like we. Yohannan is proof that exceptions were made specifically for Jews. I mean, the common claim, you hear this from Bart Ehrman and all that, is they sh- and John Dominic Cross, and they should all be th- eaten alive, right? And by scavengers or thrown in a common pit. Yohannan wasn't. He was buried in a proper tomb. He was a crucifixion victim. So obviously we have proof, uh, archaeological proof, whatever you, if you want to call that 99.99, I, I call it 100% proof. I, there's no denying that this guy was crucified and he was buried. So I don't think you can prove on a balance of probabilities that the spear in the side proves that uh, the shroud is inaccurate to the first century. Now, here's something that is interesting, the foot locations. Um, so Alan's absolutely correct, and I was glad about his archaeological finds. I didn't know about that, um, the cor- corroborating evidence. Um, so yeah, Yo- Yohannan isn't crucified in the same way that the shroud man is depicted through the metatarsal region right his is through the ankle um however again the the evidence is so scant even with the two we don't we don't biblical scholars don't know we don't have the enough resources to say this is always the way they did it and they didn't do different uh positions and i've included i think in the sources and in this uh or in my part five podcast for sure, a 109-page detailed study of the historical evidence for plausible uh, positions for crucifixion with regard to the feet. I assure you there's nothing implausible uh, in terms of a first century Jewish date for the, for the, based on the locations of the foot. But bear in mind, Alan is absolutely correct that it is different from the two ar- known archeological examples and that we have, if if he's correct about this Roman, which I I don't know about. Um, okay, so not cons- uh, whipping. Um, so yeah, the only we we do. I'm looking at a picture of a Roman flagram right now. We we do have examples of this, right? Um, it's rare they don't survive, but uh, let me try and like we we do know what a Roman flagram 
look like and that is consistent we've with got we've got uh, we've got documentary evidence there is um part of one that was discovered in pompeii i believe but that's it we've got we've got nothing else to go on um and uh you know, so we know that sometimes there were hooks in the end, but yeah. we. Uh, the, the, so I'd really like to, you to come up with because I can't find anything on this that actually shows exactly um, um, what. Um, if, if you've got a, a flagrum, where where have they got that from, um, and you know what evidence is there? Because all the things I see a kind of yeah not really very uh, you know the, the the metal part seems to have survived but the the rest of it hasn't and we can't there's no uh, yeah. actual clear provenance of the stuff that they do have so it's kind of like well okay, so, so i've seen one example i'm looking for it now or whatever um but the metal but based on what you said the metal part is all we need that's the part that's causing the injury uh, or the scourge wounds on the shroud. Um, so that is consistent with what we see. Well, no, but, I, I, but, see, I, 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 I've say, I, I'll say this in passing because um, the, there is this example. There's a the, there's a, um, a shroudist um, forensic scientist who um, a, a, an old video um, um, uh, where he says that the uh, the actual flagrum fits exactly the uh, the wounds on the uh, on the on the shroud, <laughs> except. <laughs> <laughs> the flagrum had been designed to fit the, the wounds on the shroud. So yeah, it'd be pretty obvious it would then, wouldn't it? Oh, okay. So you come up with a you come up with a um, with an actual historic flagrum. So I, I you know, so again, you were saying don't believe the stuff you read on the internet. Well, yeah, quite. <laughs> it, wait, the shroud, so the shroud images were created to fit this flagrum. So they had this fake. No, no, no. The, 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 um, the, in order to illustrate the wounds on the shroud, that somebody had manufactured a, a flagrum, and then the guy who's, who's actually sort of um, um, saying why it's so authentic, the sort of wounds are authentic, points out, look, it, it fits, <laughs> it fits the the wounds of the flagrum. It's kind of like uh, oh, it's, it's so really that's not the case though, because we. If I can find the source, I will look it up because I know I've, I've seen the picture, uh, unless that was a replica that I was looking at. Um, so we do, as far as I know, we do have uh, some examples of what our ancient Roman phlegram actually was, which is consistent with the shroud, a bifid instrument that is creating these scourge wounds. But worst case scenario, let's say I, I look into this uh, more hardcore and I find out, oh, well, that's a replica of what we think it was. Um, based on the fragments, fragmentary evidence that we have. Great, then you, you're you the one with the claim here. You have to prove that it's more probable than not that these scourge wounds, as depicted on the shroud, are inconsistent with a first century ancient Roman scourging weapon. And by your own admission, we have nothing by which to make such an adjudication. Yeah, no, no, we, okay, so we've we got some descriptions of of um, flagrum so so um uh, but uh we don't have any sort of you know hard evidence of that so 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 then we it, can't, then we can't so, um, the point i'm going to make in the next episode is is the wounds on the shroud are completely unrealistic if given the the, the sort of we know that, that they would be metalled uh, whips and a metal whip wouldn't leave those marks on the shroud which we will go into in detail on the next episode, but it, um, and uh, and I will be providing evidence for that. But uh, with but you, um, if you if you're going to say that we know um, for a fact what the actual flagrum looked like, I've well, seen, you've seen got to come. You've got to come up with the evidence, then, haven't you? <laughs> yep. If I'm making that, if I'm making that claim, um, so well, that's, that, that's why I'm saying. Well, it's hard, though, aren't they? Because they're, they're saying, "Well, look at the look at the shape of the of the um, of the." It's clear uh, from scourge wounds that a bifid instrument consistent with the phlegm that we that I that we yeah. have today. The picture that we have that we think represents the ancient Romans or actually does because it actually is the ar archaeological evidence as opposed to a re museum replica or something that I'm looking at um, is consistent with what we have on the shroud.
and but, yeah, I get I get, it's yeah, not and I'm just saying that that that, that, that there is, somebody's missing somewhere because, as I say, Andrea Nicolazzi has said, uh, according to the Gospels, Jesus suffered the f- f- uh, flagellation before his crucifixion. The texts do not clarify the form and materials of the scourge that were utilised. Since the beginning of the modern era, several commentators have speculated about the scourge's form on the basis of the gr- Greek-Roman literally, uh, literary evidence and with reference to uh, flagellation relics. In the last few centuries, scholars have provided new indications that are exemplified in great dictionaries and encyclopedic works of Greek Roman archaeology archaeology and antiquities, as well as in the consultation works available to biblical scholars. However, a close re-examination of the whole evidence compels us to dismiss nearly all the data and to conclude that we know almost nothing about the materials and form of the scourge used at Jesus' time. And so... so that, so that, if you if you've got well, well let's see it then. <laughs> that that's my point. That proves my point. Thank you. So the shroud is is real. You haven't proved it's fake, and I'm I'm saying we don't have enough data to rule out the shroud based on the location of the the nail through the foot or based on the appearance of the scourge wounds, um, or you know whatever else or or spear in the side or or that sort of thing. You you are you are making the claim in this instance. Now next week, because I'm combining the anatomical accuracies with uh, a pro historical case where I'm making the claim, then yeah, maybe you'll have a point against me um, if I can't back up what I'm saying that the Roman flagrum is an actual ancient Roman flagrum and that is consistent with uh, what we find on the shroud man. Um, then yeah okay you you will have won that point it would just be an i don't know at at best um does that does that make sense like why i'm yeah and I'm, 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 i think I, I'm, uh, for you I'm, I'm, I'm right at the beginning of this crucifixion thing crucifixion thing i did say that not all the the things i was going to mention were particularly relevant to, to the shroud i'm just yeah. bringing them in because they Seem to be interesting. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I think the, the nailing through the the the, um, the ankles, um, which would break the bones, by the way, no doubt about that. Yep. Um, the, um, does seem to be highly relevant because you're not going to find anybody pre 1962 saying that the shroud shows <laughs> throws clean sh- shows um, um, nailing through the um, the ankles. And he did. There's a, as you know, there's a there's a wound right in the middle of the foot on the top. Yeah. So. No one even after 1968 says that either, right? Like we. I, I actually, <laughs> actually, I, in my researches, I have come across because they they've seen Joe Hannan and thought, oh damn, I better better. <laughs> okay, well, move the, the goalposts. <laughs> well, the forensic experts don't say that then well, so, no, I'm not, yeah. no i'm not saying that no no they actually do go for the traditional view i i agree um but um but there are, as you know there are plenty of shroud supporters out there who say quite a lot of things so true yeah. yeah yeah there is there is pseudoscience on both sides i i definitely agree with that um yeah cool yeah okay uh so yeah i think that that's good in terms of round two i I'm happy, satisfied, and learned something new about that new archaeological find, which I love. Um, so, and the Josephus quote as well. I want to, I want to look that up. So, yeah, I think that was good uh, for round three. Then, um, so Alan, first of all, in terms of timing, uh, what are you looking at for round round three? And I'll I'll send an email. So uh, you- I don't I don't think next week is a goer for me, um, Dal. The week after that, there's a chance. I think. So, um, yes. Okay. Christmas and all that. Yep. And so, uh, what what are you going to be? Uh, so, uh, like I sort of lay out, but in this, t- what we're going to be talking about in the next round. So, the only so this is going to be corresponding to parts four and five, as well as part eight on the pro paint stuff. So I know you're going to be talking about um, pro paint observations from Macron, um, and you're also so we're going to be going back and forth on that a bit. As well as anatomical uh, accuracy yeah. slash inaccuracy, so, uh, is that? I think, 
Are you well, we have to found this out. Yeah, I mean, I could spend the whole program just going over the inaccuracies of so many of them. But um, yeah, so the, the the inaccuracies are clearly going to be a substantial part of it. Um, but I also want to cover the the issues with regards to the um, uh, the supposed 3D encoding and the supposed negative image aspect, which appears to be the, the fundamental um, things that are, that, that are pushed um, by um, Shroud supporters um, out there on the internet. Um, and so uh, I, I think I, I need to, to talk about that. Um, as far as the image formation uh, hypotheses are concerned, um, yeah, I mean, with regards to to how it um, it, it ties in with um, um, uh, 3D and and uh, and 2D, yeah, I, 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 I'll certainly be um, wanting to look at that as well. Now, because there's so many things we haven't covered, we haven't covered as you mentioned, we haven't covered um, um, traditional Jewish burial practices or the type of cloth used on the shroud and all that sort of stuff um there is so much to cover isn't it really i, I cover a lot i wonder if we're going to get your stuff in as well i have no idea so yeah what do you, well, we're what not going to do, do that talk? that stuff at all uh, we're apart uh, apart from maybe like a reference if i'm trying to establish uh the pro historicity for jesus but i'm sort of including that in the anatomical discussions because they're so related so okay so we're doing anatomical accuracies slash pro jesus history and inaccuracies you're not doing pro paint then is that or are you like are you doing macroni so, stuff oh uh, no not really um okay uh, <laughs> so, so anatomical stuff and then negativity in 3d is what we're doing yeah. Okay. Um, no. uh, image formation to the extent that it covers the uh, the, um, the the production of a negative image and uh, three dimensional characteristics. Um, yeah. So what do you mean? Im like you're going to be proposing an image mechanism? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So you'll have to let me know what that what you're going yeah. for. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what are you talking about? I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm lost still. Well. Oh. Okay, so here's the plan, guys. Um, so we're going to do the first ma major... T actually, the first thing we'll do is the negativity... Your issues on negativity in 3D. Because I'm i not... Sh I think what you're going to be going for... Like, do you, do you disagree with my presentation of what I said about them in Part 4? Uh, what did you... Sorry, remind me. What, what did you say about them in Part 4? So when you when you take issue with negativity, I mean this this is unquestioned. No one denies this, unless the only thing I can think of is you're talking about. Well, they say it's a quasi negative. It's not. Yeah, it is. It is a quasi negative. Okay. But there's no such thing as a quasi negative. It's either negative or isn't it? It isn't. So so um, um, so what is it then if it is not a negative image? Um, so I got what you're. And with the three D. Uh, again, not undeniable. No, no skeptics deny this unless you have some kind of like what? What do you mean? There's just no 3D or topographical. No, I, I think okay. So uh, again, this is question. Question: What do you mean by 3D encoding? Um, I don't think there's any 3D encoding within the uh, the image at all. It's just. Um, um, uh, but Macron actually said this was an accident it just just yeah. occurred. Um, but uh, since I'm an actual expert on um, on um, uh, three dimensional mapping, <laughs> I really ought to be talking about that and how it is that you can actually get a a two D um, map to produce three D information. Um, so, uh, so you yeah. can deny the feature then. It is it, it the data is there. I, oh no I no 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 what, no no! It's just the way that the program um, uh, interprets the data. Okay. It's, it's it's not an actual. It's not actually there. Okay. And what's the image forming mechanism you you have in mind to discuss? Well, I just, that's going to be kind of a, a, a vague. I'll, I'll be essentially. I'll be saying that that um, what are those sort of imprinting 
ideas and methods which would produce those sort of um, uh, uh, that sort of production. And as you know, a traditional photograph, which is sort of an additional picture, uh, a traditional picture which is which is lit um, in a particular way will not produce these three d images. The images have to be uh, of a certain type. Um, and we know how to replicate those. So there are we going through how it is that we can replicate the shroud um, um, with these features and that would be the sort of thing that a medieval um, artist would come up with. But I'll get, I mean, I'll, I'll send you some info on that. So yeah, yeah, just so I know which, which one to study up on to give, unless if you just want to like give your take, but do you, do you want me to come back on it? Then I need to know which... Which yeah, it's just which is fair. I, I, yeah, so I, I think I'll. Um, I'm not going to give my game away here, but uh, but I before I've actually thought it through, um, and, and um, I'll let you know. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we have a have a plan, everyone. So thanks for for putting up with this. I, I think it's half an hour short, forty minutes shorter than last time. Um, so yeah. I <laughs> it's still probably two two weeks worth, though, isn't it, Dale? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not even close. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so thank you everyone for, for listening. Thank you, Alan, for coming on. I, uh, it was a great time. And yeah, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Yeah. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.